Welcome, welcome to the Sharp Way. I'm so happy to have you this evening, another Monday evening, 8 to 10, the coolest two hours of your week. And yes, you must listen to all two hours. It is a rule. I am very happy to have you this evening. And of course, I have an amazing guest, So I'm very happy and lucky that I have a man I met a couple years ago, heard about before that, was scared to meet, but when I met him, he wasn't so scary. We'll see if he's scared this evening. The man, the myth, the legend, the entrepreneur, James Altucher. How are you? Larry, Governor Sharp, thanks for having me on the show. When you say uh, I wasn't so scary, uh, I, I was trying to be scary. I know, it wasn't working. <laughs> it wasn't working. <laughs> it wasn't I'm working. I'm such a wimp. I couldn't, I couldn't scare you. Yes, but I'm so happy you came this evening. And if somebody else wants to join us on the, uh, the program tonight and talk to me or James or both of us, feel free to give us a buzz. 573-427-527. Five, four, six, three. Give us a buzz and make a chat about anything you like. There is something, though, James, that I want to talk about that you bring up often that I love more than anything I've ever heard you bring up. And that is the idea of failure. Okay. We yeah, I'm an really expert. don't, in, in today's culture, it's almost like if someone fails, they're a loser. And now we, we, we hate them now and they're bad now. And we, but I feel like failure is a critical – I mean, I failed often. I know you failed often. I think most people who've done well what's – the, what's the old saying? Fail your way to success? Is that yeah, a saying? Yeah, but then I think I think there's two things that have happened. One is there's this failure porn now where it's like people feel like they have to fail to succeed. You see oh. a lot of that in Silicon Valley. But then I think failure now has switched to – cancel culture where you say something wrong and now you're really now you're not allowed to work ever again gotcha like if you fail at a business now people say okay he learned maybe on to the next one and and people kind of you see a lot of you know these pseudo business self-help books talk about like oh i was you know i failed in my business i didn't know what i was going to do and then i succeeded and there's a lot of this kind of like quasi bragging that way but now we see something far more insidious where your your failure is is in the words you use as opposed to your actions, which ah, is horrible. Yes. Well, you're in a way you're almost like the you're almost the anti guru in the way, right? I mean, I many times I've heard you kind of almost say don't read those books or kind of ignore those guys, but here's the real way. I, I've heard you kind of almost be against the traditional way of motivation or inspiration or whatever you want to call that. Yeah, because everyone says, oh. You must do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then you've got to hustle, and then you got to like do this and this. And how do you know? How mm-hmm. do these people know? I want to hear what, like, who made this person or these people experts and gurus and put mm-hmm. them on podiums and on stages. Like some people who are really good motivational speakers, they're only good at motivational speaking. <laughs> like, very true. Yes. And and, and where do they get these this magical 10 items for success or leadership? I sort of think you have to you have to go through fire a little bit mm-hmm. to know, to be sophisticated enough to know the nuances of of what you need to do to deal with people, to succeed, to persuade, to negotiate, to to handle the psychology of business or or politics or mm-hmm. whatever it is you want to do. Like success is really difficult. And and then once you get some success, holding on to it's really difficult. Oh, yes. You're gonna be ashamed, you're gonna be embarrassed, you're gonna be humiliated on your way down. Everyone's going to treat you horribly. <laughs> yes. And you're going to be on the ground. You're going to think, I have no friends left. I might as well kill myself. I don't know what to do. And from there, you maybe can crawl up and succeed. But a lot of people then fail from there, too. Like, there's no magical you know, panacea. You, you brought up a lot on that one. Let me try to pick up a couple pieces I like about that. The first thing you brought up was you actually, you're not ashamed at all to to bring up that you contemplated suicide. And that's almost like a... A thing that people don't want to like. Oh, he contemplated suicide. Oh my, oh my God! But you're not ashamed to say that you contemplated it. Yeah, well, you know, I I sort of hit my stride and had success many times, unfortunately. And then each and every time, I would I would not just lose my business or lose a little bit and have to come back. I would lose everything. I would go from like millions in the bank account to a hundred less than a hundred dollars in the bank account. And then lose family, lose house, lose friends. By the way, most people don't stay your friend. Most people don't even stay in your family once you <laughs> yes. lose everything. Yes. You're, nobody's returning your phone calls at that yep. point. And you have to figure out like what 
did I do wrong? Or maybe you don't think it. Maybe you start blaming everyone and you're the victim. And that's an easy trap to fall into. And and yeah, I, I, there was one time I lost everything. And I, I remember che- I was afraid to check my bank account for months. So finally, I go to the ATM machine and there was that insidious question. Do you want to check your balance? And for the first time in, in like half a year or so, I said, yes, I had $143 left in my bank account after having millions. I was just so stupid that how I lost everything. I had two baby girls and I figured, OK, they're never going to know me mm-hmm. because they're too young. But I still had an insurance policy from the days when I was riding mm-hmm. high. So I said, oh, I tried to figure out. I, I Alta vista at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's what's the best way to kill yourself without anyone knowing? Because I, <laughs> yeah, sure. I was afraid my insurance policy would like... Wouldn't pay off. Yeah, it wouldn't pay yes. off. And then I wanted to also search on what's the best way to kill yourself without hurting yourself. Because mm-hmm. I, just because I wanted to die didn't mean I wanted to hurt myself. <laughs> right. And, and uh, it's actually almost impossible to do both those things, particularly at the same time. Well, it's funny you bring that up. You know, in my own world, after 2008, that's when my crash hit, right? I, I thought I was the greatest guy in the world. Everything's awesome. What were you doing? What were you doing for a I living? was consulting. I was doing sales training is what I was doing, right? And if you remember 2007, I mean, they were throwing money away. Yeah. And, and I thought, because I'm super smart. See, you're, I, you were I'm training guy. subprime mortgage brokers? No, no, no. <laughs> what, what I was doing two, I thought there were two fields that would never go down together because I thought, you know, I've got these two fields. Commercial real estate, investment banking. They'll never Uh-oh. go down together, will Uh-oh. they? Yes, they will. It was exactly the worst two fields that I had. Those are my specialties. My income dropped 90% within three months. I had two employees I had to get rid of. I had to shut my office down. But I held on. Entrepreneur, right? I'm optimistic. I can do this. There's no I – of course I can. And I remember as the thing was collapsing and I was having to uh, shut my office down that I spent all my money and time in, I, I was considering the same thing. I was like, you know, if I fell out of this window – it would be an accident. I was thinking the same thing. Maybe that was the right answer too. So I get where you're going. I was losing everything. But what I did, which was a little bit different, is I was good at hiding it. So I had enough fog up that people couldn't see that I was collapsing. Right? Pete, but the problem then, this is an interesting story. It 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 shifts into something kind of weird that happened all at the same time. I remember you 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 tell your story about how your things were so bad and that's when you kind of turned it around. I had a similar story. When my business was completely collapsing, at the exactly the same time, my second daughter was born. Oh, my gosh. And she almost died. In 18 days old, she had open heart surgery. Mm-hmm. And she goes into the hospital on machines at 18 days old. My wife is a mess, as any mom would be. She literally packs up and moves into the hospital. So I lose my wife, who was the, the major primary, primary caretaker. She, wasn't, she was a stay-at-home mom. I have a six-year-old daughter at this time, so I became stay-at-home dad out of nowhere, uh, literally overnight. My business is collapsing, and my daughter's dying, and here's the best part. My mom got diagnosed with stage four cancer Mm. all at the same time. I was a disaster, and I was trying to hold out and not let people know that I was collapsing. But you know, when you hold hold it in like that, that's even And that's that's what happened. All of a sudden, what happened is I blew up. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I'm not a drug guy. It's not what I do. So my way of dealing with my feelings was I ate them. And I just was eat. I was literally having a, an entire pizza and a two liter of Coke for lunch. And because I was isolating myself, right, not letting people know what was happening, there was no friend there to go, dude, Larry, you, you can't do that. There was no one there to tell me it was wrong. And my wife was in the hospital, not caring about me at all. So she wasn't there to go, hey, dude, Larry, you, you, you can't do that. She wasn't there for that either. So there was no one to tell me it was wrong. And all of a sudden, I couldn't fit in my suits anymore. Because I got so big, I I couldn't get in the suits to go back to work. So when I finally pulled my head out of my derriere and decided I was going to go off and try to do something again because I had no option, everyone was depending upon me to do something, I physically couldn't. So what did I do? I went on no carb, low carb so that I could drop the weight because it was harsh and I was fanatic. I was like every day I was literally eating water, coffee, steak, eggs, nothing else. It was insane. I dropped 40 pounds in two months. Wow. Didn't put it back on. I've been on keto for about nine years now. 
All the time. You all never have carbs. I, yeah, I do. Here or there, right? Mm-hmm. But now I'm on maintenance, so I don't care, right? I mean, I dropped the weight. Now, once in a while, I have them. Christmas time, you know, Halloween, I have some candy. Well, but I think general that- rule, I, I just, I rarely eat carbs. I don't, I rarely eat them. But I did it because it was the only way for me to take control of something, right? And that control of my diet allowed me to have control of other things, and it's the way I kind of rebuilt myself. And most people in my world, the people closest to me knew, but most people in my world didn't know I was collapsing at all. They had no idea. And what I found when it comes to failure is failure is fine as long as it's in the past. So when I told people a year later how bad I was failing, I was amazing. If I had told them then, I was a loser. No, I I, I get it. And some of the failures I've written about had happened in my past, but some I was writing about in, in real time. Yeah. And people would say to me, are, are you going to be okay? Like, this is like, why? and I would get tweets like, or people would tweet, this is like watching, James Altucher is like watching a train wreck in real time. <laughs> wow. And, but what can you do? Like, yes, if you're no, not, I get it. You, you, you know, I would turn on CNBC and I'd watch, or, uh, you know, any of these channels and I'd watch like uh, financial experts, hedge fund managers talk about, you know, wearing their suits, talking about investments and the financial crisis in 2008 or, yep. or, or Trump in 2016. And everyone's acting like an expert, but I know them. I'm like, yes, you, yes. you were, you were dead broke a year <laughs> yes, ago yes. or this one, you know, the, another one, I know how you survived. Like, yes. and it wasn't pleasant what you did. <laughs> right, like, right, right. so, so it's all these guys were like, so, uh, and, and uh, yeah, it was guys mostly all these guys were, were so fake. And I was thinking, you know what? I just, I'm just going to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And I started these writing these articles. And what happened was you lose half your audience because they're like, what the hell is he doing? Is he like, I would have CEOs. I knew call me. Did you have a stroke? We heard you had a brain tumor. And then, but then suddenly I got 10 X the audience because you realize everyone's going through this. Yep. Everyone has the authenticity. Matt is it matters. It does. I don't know anybody who's like and say, man, what's, my life has just been great every <laughs> yeah, single day. I'm perfect. <laughs> Nothing ever goes wrong with me. So, yeah. Let me grab a call if I could. I'm going to grab someone from Massachusetts who wants to talk about entrepreneurship. That's right up your, your alley. Great. So, let me see if I can grab Raphael. Raphael, how are you? Uh, this is Tommy, Larry. Oh, we got Tommy. No worries. I'm happy, Tommy. Glad to have him in Indiana. You going to talk about personal wealth today? Yeah. Um, let's, uh, let, let's take a step back. Okay. And let's let's actually visualize what we're talking about because okay. if you really think about personal wealth. Yeah. Okay. That definition has several different facets to it. Sure. There is the personal wealth that you go out and you work to gain or right. you invest into the stock market to gain your personal wealth. Sure. You're but talking about money basically here, right? Cash. You, right. Yeah. But I got then you. if you turn to the if you turn that around, your personal wealth comes from what you are fed from other sources. What are you worth to, let's say, your political party? What are What is your worth towards your place of employment? So you're talking they, like that a, a, is social, a social, uh, kind of social capital. Is that but, what you mean? But, but also... But top, it, top, Tommy, hold on one second. Go ahead. Tommy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to that, though, because personal could also uh, apply to your personal self. So when, when Larry was just talking about how he got to uh, in, in a handle on his own dealings with failure, he, he had self-discipline. He, he lost 40 pounds. Sometimes it's like when you take care of yourself, that's how you sort of start to accumulate wealth from the inside. So you eat well, sleep well, deal with relationships in healthy ways, be creative. And then you have this core point of view, this core health inside that from there, wealth and personal wealth can emanate. Not necessarily the validation of a boss or a political party or whatever. Those are ancillary. But Tommy, are you saying that if you it, that it, the money is good, but these other social pieces are more important, as important? Where where are you saying this? Okay, all right. What the, what I'm driving at is is you know yeah, personal wealth can be attributed to money, but mm-hmm. the most important thing is exactly what he said and exactly what I said. You have to have a personal wealth that is one from inside of you, from taking care of yourself, from eating right, 
from dieting, yep. from from learning how to deal with stuff. But you also have to be fed that personal wealth of, hey, you are important to us because. Ah, or, so you're you saying your social circle. Me. Exactly. Got it. You have to be careful of, of who you, you know, okay, let, let me use this as an example. It's kind of like you go out and you invest in the, in, in the stock market, all right? Yeah. Okay, so I've invested into you. You've reinvested into me. Mm-hmm. Therefore, I have a personal wealth that I know is high in your opinion. Yep, that's true. Personal wealth. Same, as, same thing with you with me. I have a high, a high rating of you. Therefore, that creates personal wealth within you. No, no, I, I like what you're saying. I, I absolutely do. I, I think that you know there, there's a there's a concept that I talk about, which is the concept of power. Right? People ask me what power is, and many people think power is physical power. I'm going to beat somebody up, or I'm going to move a, a table, or something. And I say power is your ability to influence others, right? Influence their behavior, or whatever the case may be. If you have you you generally speaking will have better power if people respect you to your point Tommy right if I've invested in someone the people will tend to invest back in me and when I ask them for things they're more apt to say yes if I've given them a reason to say yes and if you have personal power even if you lose your money you can still get wealth because having power gives you access to wealth having money itself you can lose so I think your point's very well taken. I think you do want to be more powerful individually. James, right. you want to say something? You, you Hold do. on. Yeah, yeah, James, you want to say yeah I just want to add, though, like there are going to be times when the loss of, of wealth will also make you lose the validation of all these personal mm-hmm. investments you've made. Good point. Like, you know, your partners, mm-hmm. your coworkers, your, your bosses, maybe the investments you've made. And, and the world's going to let you down. And then... The only place you have to go, and, and Tommy, you, you, you said this as half of your equation, but the only place you have to go is inside of yourself. Right. That's where you find the real power. If you train your creativity, if you're healthy because you can't, you can't have power if you're sick in bed, if you have good relationships because you can't have power if you're arguing with your spouse all day, mm-hmm. if you surrender to the things you can't control so you only focus on the things you can control, that's a kind of personal power. Sure. And from that base... You could then get back to being persuasive, to being to emanating a sense of of mastery, of self mastery, and I think that's the beginnings of of any any quest for wealth, unless it's just sort of you know winning the lottery. Yeah, and you know, okay. let me let me go one step further with that. You you brought up a lot of good points. You know, when when I talk about the idea that I'm I'm keto and that I rarely will have carbs, I hardly ever have soda or cookies or sugar. It's very rare that I have no bread, no pasta. It's very rare that I eat these things. And people say, "Oh my God, Larry, isn't that horrible? Don't you feel like you're 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 not you you you're losing everything?" And I said, "I'm actually freer because in my world, in my in my the way I've spun it in my head at least, right, is I'm it's not that I'm free to do what I want. I'm free from my vices." And it's another way of looking at freedom, right? I'm, I don't have to grab the soda. I don't have to grab the carbs. I don't have to do it. I'm free from my vices. So I think it still creates a personal freedom or a personal power and ability to say, I can, I can, I can beat this thing. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a great point. I think when you're, when you ever, you can say, uh, I don't have to X, mm-hmm. you're free. Absolutely. So, so like there was this, there was this two and a half year period k- kind of recently where I threw out everything I owned I lived out of a carry-on bag, and I just lived in Airbnb. I didn't rent, and I didn't own. I just lived out of Airbnbs all around the country for about two and a half years. And I realized, kind of in the middle of this, there's really no object I needed. I didn't have to have any... Now, I missed things, and I sure. was nostalgic, and I felt sad. I had didn't have my childhood pictures or even my kids' baby pictures or anything. But... Okay, it's okay to be sad too. Right. I don't have to be happy yeah. uh, all the time. Uh, you know, it was just, you know any kind of like discipline like that where you give up something, yeah. you realize what what's really you and what you really care about and what your real voice is. And and to Tommy's point, I think that's personal wealth. S- subtraction is wealth in that sense. Oh, interesting. Subtraction is wealth. Boom. Yes. Thank you. There we go. Tommy, thank you so much for your call. What? I appreciate it, brother. And Larry, wh- one last thought. Go ahead. Uh, and and. You just hit on this just a minute ago with what you was saying, Larry, and it goes back to your governor campaign last year. Okay. Your motto was make an impact. Yes, correct. All right? 
So if you gain personal wealth within, from within yourself, you have made impact. I like that, Tommy. Yeah, I like that's, that a good, that's a that's good, good way to put it. Yeah, well done. So, Larry, thanks so much, buddy. I'll talk to you next Monday. Thanks, brother. Have a good one. All righty. Uh, bye. Bye. All right. So, yeah, I mean, I think this is an, an important, I mean, what Tommy brings brings up is, you know, I think most people think that gaining wealth is very simply just some kind of formula. Yeah. Right? It's oh, a formula. Oh, that's totally it. Like, people want to know, gosh, what should I invest in Apple stock today? Yeah. And that's ridiculous. That will never, in the history of the universe, that will never get anyone wealth or those kinds of questions. Right. It's It's got to be something that begins internally and then keeps going from there. Yeah. In some way, shape, or form, right? It's funny how a lot of uh, of, of self-help books are very often the, the ones that uh, that people like and that have staying power. Um the, the classic one is like how to win friends and influence people. You know, classic books like that tend to have a lot of things that don't say do X, Y, and Z, but they say break your habits. Yeah. Right? It's really what they're saying is break your habits, right? Change some habits to have better habits. People often tease me and they say when I'm out there talking to people that I tend to go into help mode very fast. When you and I met, right? When you and I met for lunch about two years you, ago. You were helping me to decide not to run for governor that's against true. you. That's true. Yes. Also, yes. But <laughs> you were very helpful with that. But you were talking about a, a presentation you were doing. And I just gave you my two cents. I don't remember if you remember or not, but I just gave you my two cents. And you were like, oh, that's not a bad idea. Whatever. Yeah. You were writing stuff down. I, I hope you incorporated something. I don't remember if you did or not. I don't remember to tell you the truth. But I remember I did it. And when people asked me, oh, so you met James, what happened? I said, we talked about the governorship. We talked about some presentation he was doing. And one of my friends said, would you give him some advice? I said, I did. He said, Larry, you always do that. And I said, yeah, because I always want to be in the habit of helping. Because often when I help people, I get nothing in return. Yeah. But I want to be in the habit of helping because there's going to be a time when someone really needs me. And I'm going to be able to make that impact Tommy was talking about because someone's going to really need me. And I'm going to make that help and I'm going to impact someone's life. It's going to happen. And there's going to be someone of stature who can help me out in return. You know, That's going to happen too. And it's, it's the giving without thought of getting anything back right that is really important because a then you don't feel that tug that need like oh i that transactionally like i yes. just gave him something i hope he gives something back then you also free yourself again like whenever i've been really just like just just down and out and trying to find opportunity the worst thing you do is call up and so say to someone hey can i help you and you pay me or whatever mm -hmm. like what i used to do is uh, just to get out of it, I would write down 10 ideas a day. And sometimes I would write down 10 ideas for other people. Mm -hmm. And I would send them to the other people. And one out of 20 would write back to me mm -hmm. and say, hey, this is great. Can we have coffee? Yep. Could, and, and you never know. what I, 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 I did that with like 30 people. Previously, I wrote to them and I said, hey, can I buy you a cup of coffee? None of them replied because right, yes, no, like yes. Warren Buffett doesn't need a free cup of coffee Correct. from me. Yes. Like he could care less. Right. And then I would look at everyone's business and I'd give them 10 ideas for their business. I said, I would say, here are these ideas. I'm a fan. I don't need anything. Don't even write back. Good luck. Mm -hmm. And two out of the 30, three out of the 30 actually wrote back and one gave me my first writing job. I've been a professional writer ever since. The other one gave me money and I started a hedge fund. And I've been a professional investor ever since. So you never know. So I got to start writing more ideas to more people. That's, see, there's the that, formula. That you is give the key. Me the formula. After all, you are a guru. No, oh my but, God. but it's only because I did it. And, <laughs> yes. and every time, every time I forget to do it and every time I like lose everything again, because it's happened five times since then, I always get back to basics and I start writing down ideas. Not to necessarily give to other people, but just to improve my creativity because sure. it's like a muscle and you have to exercise it. And then amazing things happen. I write, I would write to Amazon, get an invitation to hang out there, write to LinkedIn, write to Google. And I've been to all these places just on the basis of my ideas. Sure. Oh, I love it. It's great. All right. So let me grab another call if I could. And by the way, if you want to join us, you can join us on the program if you like. Very simple. Pick up the phone. Give us a call. 573-427-5400. Four, six, three. And mom, if you want to start talking to me again after six years, call that number. I'm there here. There we go. Mom, please, we want to hear from you. All right, right now I'm going to grab Raphael from Massachusetts. Raphael, how are you? Good. How about you, Larry? I'm doing great. Says you want to talk about entrepreneurship. Is that true? Yes, it is. Awesome. Talk to me, my friend. All right. So first of all, just uh, shout out to James. Uh, he has a 
fantastic podcast that I love. Oh, oh Raphael, thank you so much. I really appreciate you saying that. So why don't you pitch it real fast? Hold on, Raphael. Pitch your, pitch your uh, podcast, please. Well, I basically talk to anybody who I feel has achieved peak performance in one way or the other, and I try to figure it out. How did you do it? Because every everybody's path to peak performance is different. Mm-hmm. And I know I know it's inevitable I'm going to like you know lose again or fail again mm-hmm. or be depressed or miserable again and I want to know all the different ways to to get from zero back up again. And so I how do we hear it? People. How do we hear it? Where do we have to go? The James Altucher show, you can find it iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. There we go. All right. And, go. And, and subscribe to my TikTok account for 60-second videos of nothing. Look at that. TikTok. Just jump on it. All right. Raphael, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so I have three quick questions. That's not true. Uh, James. No, it really is. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> James, if, if you had only one book to recommend for someone that wants to start a business, what would it be? Two the Hold on, let's do it one at a time. Do it one at a time. One at a time. Oh, okay, what, okay. What's what's the book you would recommend if you had to recommend some one book? One book to start a business? Uh, probably Zero to One by Peter Thiel. So Peter Thiel is the founder of PayPal, and he was the first investor in Facebook. And he has a very odd way of looking at things. By the way, he's also a libertarian. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has a very odd way of looking at things in business and I, i'm very i'm very intrigued by just the way his mind works so it's, i don't even remember any direct advice from the book but i just remember thinking boy this guy thinks in a very unusual way and i i admired that and i i tried to 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 always look at things in in a way that's different from how other people look at things like if you're in the room that's least crowded that's probably the right room to be in for starting a business there we go there we go um i think um, I might pick To Sell as Human by Daniel Pink. Okay. I might do that. That would be one thing. Or if you want a simple book, I might do Purple Cow. No, no, Tribes. I'll do Tribes by Seth per, Godin. Per, yes, Seth Godin's books yes. are all good. Yes, maybe Tribes by Seth Godin would be my, that because that gives you the concept of what to do and how to build. But I like I Purple think Cow, though, because Purple, purple Cow is great. It's like you find that one thing. Like the, if there was a Purple Cow in a field of cows, you're noticing the Purple Cow. Absolutely. But it's the same thing. It's like you go you you go to the place least crowded. If you want to go in the room of Purple Cows, you'll probably be the only one there. <laughs> yes. So, so, but that was a great book. That was my first uh, book I read by Seth Godin. There we go. Good. All right, give me number two. All right, number two is the best way to find a co-founder. The best way to find a co-founder. There I we think go. I think that's I think that's organic. Like there's there's so many ways to find a bad co-founder <laughs> that I would kind of avoid. I would try to work as hard as possible without any co-founder at all until someone naturally arises that impresses you, that you feel is loyal, that you trust. It's very hard. I I have for each one of my businesses that I'm involved in now, I have different co-founders, but my initial investment business, which I still have, I've had the same co-founder for for 20 years and we we have never once had an argument. We disagree constantly mm-hmm. and somehow or other we talk it out and we reach consensus. We have never really had an argument. It's kind of amazing. And by the way, politically, he is the exact opposite of me in almost every single way. But we've never had an argument, which shows that you could just disagree with people and still have a very mutual, beneficial relationship, friendship, partnership, and so on. It's the only way to have an interesting one. That's I for disagree sure. with my wife every day, and we do fight, but then we make up. There we go. I love that. I love that. It's funny you bring it up. Um, for to answer your, to answer your question. I, I agree 100 percent I would try to have no co-founder I would try to have someone who either is an employee or someone who is a a, ten, uh, um, a 1099 or someone who's an investor I would try to do that just my personal matter. I agree I, I think co-founding can can be a problem there's so many chances for it to fail yeah but you brought up a very important point on um you know trying to scratch go to number three F- third question uh, the third one is the one mistake you cannot make as a business owner. Ooh, the one mistake you cannot make as a business owner. Gosh, I mean, there's a lot of mistakes you can make as a business owner. But I think, you know, 99% or I'll say 95% of business is communication with others. And you really have to make sure you communicate carefully to your customers, your employees, your partners, your investors, your potential acquirers, 
uh, uh, you know, vendors that you use, you have to communicate very succinctly and carefully to each one of them. And by the way, you have to also communicate to yourself mm. properly. Like you can't, you, I, I, you know, I'm going to give another, I, I, there's not one, there's, there's plenty of ways. The other important thing is don't spend money if you, if you can avoid it. Like don't invest more than you can afford. Don't, you're going to go broke that way. Don't invest you know, money management at the poker table and at the business table are equally important. If you're going to put more than you could psychologically handle or financially handle, you're going to either be extremely unhappy or extremely broke, probably both. Well, you know, the, the, the funny part you bring it up is two parts, right? I, most people, when I'm talking about small businesses, they say, well, there's many ways for the business to go under. And I go, no, there's only one way. Um, there's many paths to the one way, but there's only one way. Once you run out of money, you're finished. Yeah. Right. Once you run out of money, business finished. Right? There are many ways to run out of money, tons of ways to do that. But you've got to realize if you run out of money, you're done. That's, that's the game. right? If you can somehow keep raising money, then you can do it. So the goal is to not run out of money for an individual business. But I think overall a longer one, and, and I don't know if this, this makes sense for you, Raphael, is breaking someone's trust and not caring. Yeah. I think that's the one you can't make because – I say it in politics all the time because I, I, I live in a libertarian world and there are very few of us relatively. And I argue with them all the time as libertarians always argue. But I always say something to every libertarian I argue with. I say, I can have you mad at I can't have you not trust me. It's a critical distinction, right? I can have you say that Larry Sharp's an ass. That's fine. Or he's wrong or he's dumb or he's whatever. I can't have him go, I don't trust that guy. Right. And if you do break someone's trust, and sometimes you will, either by mistake or on purpose, whatever, you've got to acknowledge that you did and try to do it right without asking for forgiveness. And that's a critical piece. You can't ask for forgiveness. You've just got to say, James, I know I screwed you over. I shouldn't have. I'm sorry. I'm going to make it right. You do that. You've got a chance at, at coming back. If you screw some pe people over and they realize, Larry Sharp screws people over, doesn't care, and keeps going. The odds of your success, in my opinion, go down tremendously. Th that's really true. And I'll make comment on each one of these things, which Please. is that on, on that one, I have a story where I one time started a, a hedge fund with a group of people, and I was the investor, and I messed up. I was down mm -hmm. the first month, and I was ashamed of it. I didn't call. They, they were calling me. How'd you do? How'd you do? I didn't call them back for like about a week or so. And they said, listen, we don't care that you were down the first month but we're pulling the money because you didn't call us back that yep. first week. And that's to your point. Now, because I did event call them after a week or so, we remained friends. And eventually, six years later, we started doing deals again. And they've proven to be life-changing for me. But, you know, you're very right. You've got to just talk to people yes. and communicate with people. The second thing is, and this is this is to the point of, of your other point of going broke, before starting a business, get a customer. So like I, I, my very first business that I started, I stayed at my full-time cubicle corporate job for 18 months. And then at night, I would work all night at my business that I'd started on the side. I didn't leave my full-time job till I had, I had 12 employees in an office, like 20 blocks down from where my corporate job, I was like this, this CEO making a good salary revenues at my business that I started while making, you know, 40,000 year as a computer programmer in a cubicle at my full-time job. I was so scared of taking the risk of jumping. So get customers and, and, and it, you can never be too safe except to not try at all. Mm, nice. Good. Rafael, did I answer your questions? Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, awesome. Rafael. Have a good one. All right. I, I, I want to make sure that if, if people like what we're, we're, if they like what we're doing here and they're happy and they want to support us, you know, this isn't free. This costs time and money, and we're business too, so please help us out. Head on over to patreon.com slash sharpway and help us out. Support us with the Patreon. Give whatever you can give. If it's $5, if it's $25, if you're really wealthy and you can drop 500 bucks, do it. 500 bucks a month so that we can keep doing this and keep bringing this message out and, and supporting this show. I need the help, so, so help uh, me out. Larry, I have a question. Go ahead. So so when you were running for governor, you raised uh, half a million dollars, you said, yep. and- what if you had money left over? And I'm asking this because I honestly don't know the answer. What if you have money left over at the end of that? Can that go into like a foundation that could pay for this podcast? Or? Absolutely, but uh, no, not to pay for this podcast. What no. if the foundation was doing the podcast? Correct, yes. How, how it works for those you don't know, I'm still raising money. I haven't stopped. 
I still raise money. And those of you who love my campaign and want me to get out there and help out in New York, you still can. Go to LarrySharp.com slash donate. Thank you for that. You allowed me to plug. Head over to LarrySharp.com slash donate. And that is a is still my, – my political committee is still open. And I kept it open on purpose because I wanted people to see that I was still being active. You can check. I, I so file every three A political committee months. is different than a race. So you're um, not running for anything. That's correct. But I can still keep it open as long as it's doing political things. It's still fine. And I'm still doing it. For those of you who see me, I do at least one weekend event every single month still. I crossed the entire state last year, hit all 62 counties. I will do it again this year. I will cross all 62 counties again this year, supporting local candidates. If that matters to you, keep donating. I, I want monthly donations. $5 a month is great. I still raise money every single day, every single month. People still give. So I can go out and do political things, and you want to know what's ha- what's happening, you can check my filings. My my, my filings they are still online. Check them whatever you like. Okay, so, Larry, yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna do it right now. This is a hundred North Korean won. Oh my God, I'm a it's, bazillionaire. It's, that's amazing. It, it was issued in 1976. That's the the grandfather. It's Kim Jong Il, and it's you could buy yourself a hamburger in North Korea with that. This is actually Kim Il Sung. Kim Il Sung, whoever yes. whoever Kim the Il-sung. grandfather is. By the way, this is interesting. Now, all Note, the Kims are the same to me. On Kim Il Sung. Kim Il Sung is actually the longest current serving uh, hec- uh, sec- I'm sorry, um, head of state in the world. Well, no, that's the grandfather of the current one. Yes, and he still he is the only leader ever to become president for eternity. Ah, I see. Yes, everyone in, else in, becomes president in, for life in North Korean heaven. That's correct. He is, he is actually president for eternity. He is the longest current serving head of state in the world. The one, the one, yes. uh, and suggest- will always be. For eternity, he will be the longest serving head of state ever. Which is good for you yes. because that currency is going to be valid forever then. <laughs> exactly Except right. yes. because of sanctions, you can't buy a hamburger in the U.S. with it. There we go. You That's have okay. to be careful how you use it. Or I'll have to give it to Dennis Rodman next yeah, time he goes. He could, he could get you something, <laughs> some souvenirs. Maybe he'll bring me back a Korean hamburger. Yes. That'd be awesome. Assuming they have Korean North, North Korean hamburgers. Who knows? Bulgogi, whatever. Yes. There we go. We'll have some of that. I love it. So, yes, I appreciate it. But to answer your question, yes, I can still collect absolutely – um, and I still do, and it's it's public. You but what do you do it. with it? Literally, that's that's how I pay for gas and tolls and hotels and travel and when I buy T-shirts, right? Not these; these are these are Sharpwood T-shirts. But I have Governor T-shirts. I have Libertarian signs that I hand out and give out. I pay for all those things, absolutely. And can you donate to other Libertarian? I can, races? absolutely. Yes. What? But the reason why I don't do that is the second that I donate to one, ah. I will get requests for eighty thousand. So what I do is instead is I use the money to travel there and then I raise money for the candidate right there. So I raise money for the candidate because what I can't do, by the way, is if I go to an event and I raise money at an event for myself, it becomes very dicey if I raise it for someone else because then who would you give the money to and now we've got issues. So I'd rather just give me the money up front, put it in the campaign. I will use that money to travel to you and then raise money for you. So I went – the last time I, I – did this? I think I raised like four or five thousand dollars. I raised eighteen thousand dollars for California. My my biggest one ever is for the uh, the Gary Johnson campaign. I raised one hundred thirty thousand dollars in one night. Wow, that's my biggest one. Who was the biggest donator? I don't remember then. Tell you there was a whole room. I worked a whole room for about an hour and a half. Yeah. So yeah, so I mean, I actually I remember someone gave me a thousand dollars to tell a joke. What was the joke? Um, it was um, what what kind of what kind of salad do libertarians like? What's the answer? Let us alone. <laughs> That's a All joke. Right. Yes. Uh, I was afraid Thousand gonna, dollar joke right there. I was afraid you are going to say toss salad, some kind no, no, of prison no, no, no. thing. Let us alone. <laughs> Boom. Thousand dollars right there. So yes, absolutely. Good. So yes, so absolutely feel free to donate, guys. I'm happy to do it. Please, I'm happy to have you. You know, so, uh, you once did an event at, uh, so I, I own the comedy club uh, Stand Up New York. Yes. Uh, yeah, you once did an event there. Twice I, I, I did events there. Yes. I, yeah. did, I did events there twice, and at the end- um, of the first event, I actually did a little bit of short stand up, a little bit, a little yeah? bit of fun, a little, oh, bit, cool. little bit cute. Yes, I'm not that funny, but I was funny enough. <laughs> so That's all it great. takes. That's all it takes. Funny enough. Yes. So, but yes, I, I love doing that. And the thing you'll see me do often when I when I go out is I will go to a lot of events that are not the standard event, right? I'll go to a comedy club. I'll go to a vape shop. I'll go to a gun shop. Um, I actually I did a I did a, a podcast from someone's basement. I don't really care. It's like a high schooler. It doesn't matter. I'll, I'll do anything to keep it in my name out and to keep going 100%. Old. And then I, I share their stuff so they grow. Now, l- let me ask you a question. I'm wondering if this is a good idea or a bad idea. So New York State, $60 billion in debt. 
More than that. More than that? 400. 400. All right. I was it's way off. $6 billion deficit. Okay. $6 billion deficit every year, $400 billion in debt. So what about doing things like selling off the Port Authority? Port Authority no, is actually no, no, a you profitable cannot. institution. No, not at all. If, 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 when you have a chance, head over to LarrySharp.com and you will see all my policies. We don't want to sell off anything because New York State, the people will not accept that at all. Instead, the answer is leasing naming rights. You don't want to sell off. But if you start selling off, you, the New York, people in New York State will, will never go for that. But they will go for retaining the asset and leasing naming rights. That was one of my ideas. Instead of us having the George Washington Bridge or the now we have the Mario Cuomo Bridge, instead now we have the Verizon Bridge or the Kellogg's Bridge or the 3M Bridge. Insert thing. And these are companies that drop four or five billion dollars every year on marketing. They'll easily drop a hundred hundred million dollars yeah, a year. I like that. Easy. What what about uh, the public schools like the Sunnis and the and the hospitals they own? What would you do with those? Uh, what, what do you mean? What would I do? I would with those? I would sell them all off. No, I'm not going to sell it off. You have, you're 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 asking you're asking. I'm a big fan, and a lot of libertarians are not. I'm a big fan of incrementalism, right? A lot of libertarians think I'm crazy. They think it's wrong. Just got to end it. And my point is, I see a difference, and this is a little bit off topic, but I'm happy to, to bring this up. I see a big difference between the libertarian party and libertarian activists, right? Some people don't. They think the party is the movement. They're exactly the same. And the goal of the party is to be an activist. I disagree. I think the party was built that way. It was started not really to be a party. I think that's true. And people often get mad at me and go, Larry, the party wasn't started that way. I think they're right. But in my view, the party is separate from the overall movement. I'm just part of it, but it's separate from the activists. Activists should be saying what you're saying all day long. Activists should be wearing shirts that say, legalize recreational cocaine. I mean, that's what they should be doing. Legalize all drugs. But, but they should, of course, they're activists. But if I'm running, I'm trying to gather more of the mainstream people to hear my message so they can see the other activists who's saying what's appropriate. So for me, I have to look at my local world, right? If I'm in Wyoming, that might fly, particularly when I have so much federal land, things like that. I'm in New York State. We just reelected for a third term a Democratic governor who is as horrible as could be, and we elected him with over 60% of the vote. New York State gave him a mandate, and I'm going to come in and say, sell off SUNY? I, I might as well just say, let's fly to Mars. There, yeah, it's right. simply not going to happen. I, I, I agree with I, what, I you're what you're saying. I'm just saying I'm not going to get anywhere, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So I would rather say instead of that, let's just instead, let's change the entire system and allow for good competition. So most of my policies were never about destroying government. They were about providing a good opportunity, a, a good um, choice. So government either has to get better or goes away. Right. You talked often about the idea of you want to you know, go off and do this stuff, but you want to have a safety net in business. Governments are different, right? I can't just say, and it's unfair to say, get rid of all entitlements. While financially, brilliant. But per it's impossible. First off, the government has given you entitlements for how many decades? So they set your life up to be in these entitlements. It would be literally unfair to just take them away. And second, nobody, no, not nobody. There's no way you can get elected saying that. So my whole goal was, as an example, I'll give you another good example, um, child care. When it comes to child care, what I said is I want to create not just licensed child care, but what I call child gardens, right? You have children, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you, ever, do you ever take your children to the park? No. Um, have you ever? Uh, when they were really little, Perfect. yeah. So when I was little, take them to the park. If I had a small child and I say, hey, do me a favor, James, take my kid to the park. And you go, yeah, Larry, I'll do it. Do me a favor, here's five bucks, you get some ice cream. You go, yeah, Larry, all good. There's no license required for that. That's just you going off and taking my kids to the park. We have an agreement. My goal, my, my policy was why can't we pull you out and put a nonprofit in? So now just mean, mean a nonprofit, I'm in agreement. Can you keep my kid in your yard for eight hours today? You can, good. What do you want? Five bucks? Here's five bucks. Insert local black church that's suffering. Insert VFW that's suffering. Insert American Legion that's suffering, right? All of a sudden now a nonprofit has a way of generating funds, whatever funds they want. And if you're a church, the, the fee is probably show up on Sunday and uh, bingo nights Thursday, come here and call the numbers. So that becomes what we do. What does that mean? Now, if I'm particularly a single mom, but it could be anybody, I'm trying to work my way off of public assistance. I can't because if I have two kids or more, the system's set up. So that if the second I start to work, I lose everything, I actually make less money, and I spend less time with my kids. 
But if instead now I have the child garden option, I can drop my kids off my local church or VFW or American Legion or Knights of Columbus, insert thing here, right? And five bucks a week or whatever it is and go to work. Now, people always tell me, but Larry, there'll be no background checks. Then ask them for background checks. But Larry, they, w they won't be licensed. Then don't use them. Wait. I'm not getting rid of licensed daycare. If you want to use licensed daycare, please use it. But if you want, you may also use the child garden. It is a voluntary option that many people begin to use. As that happens, guess what will happen? There'll be no massive deaths and killings in these things because that's not what happens. And people will see that the regulation isn't as required. And we can begin to pull regulation off of the daycares. Well, and also, like you say, this helps the the working poor, the people, correct, who, the people who make more money than so they can't get public assistance. Yep. But babysitting is expensive. Yes, it is. So absolutely. But but, but it's oh, voluntary. So but, if they don't want to go, they don't have to. There's no requirement. Right. It's and I you. I see what you're saying with incrementalism. So people buy into that. But it's yes. also the same argument. I and I'll take it to an extreme. Go ahead. I kind of don't think you need to have a medical degree to perform surgery. Yes. I don't think you need a law degree to be a lawyer. Yep. I I have lectured at law firms and I don't have a law degree and every lawyer would be taking notes. Literally now, I do the same exact thing. I consult with law firms all the time. Uh the opening statements, closing statements, witness prep. I do it I do the same thing. I don't have a law degree. And then and a lot of people say, "Well, don't you want your doctor to have like a Harvard medical degree?" And I'm like, no way. I want my doctor to have done a thousand surgeries. No, no, but see, that's what I don't want. I don't want you deciding what anybody wants. I simply want the option to do that. Right. The option. Right? So I, what but is, it's gonna, what's going to happen, though, is then uh, degrees, prices will go down. You got it. Yes. Student loan debt will go down. You got Insurance it. Insurance costs will probably go down because there isn't all this debt and so on. A hundred percent. Yes. That's, what I'm, that's my point, right? If we create that, you're exactly correct. If we create a secondary option, I'm not getting rid of people having uh, licenses for doctors, but I don't want to call them licensed. I'm going to call them credentials. So you can go to a doctor's office. If you want to has a credential, hey, we are state licensed. That's us. Awesome. Or go to James. But, That's fine. Well, whatever you don't like. Don't go for me. Don't go to me for brain surgery. But other bad than that. idea. Yes. <laughs> but but I, but I, I had could... an actual thing which 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 was for licensing. Would you ask your friend to do it? Right. There's a license, by the way, to walk a dog. There's a license to braid hair. You know this, right? There's a license to walk a dog and braid hair. And my question is, would you ask your friend to braid your hair? Of course. Would you ask your friend to walk a dog? Sure. Why is there a license? There should be no license for something that you could ask your friend to do. Would you ask your friend to perform brain surgery? No, get a license. I'm fine. Let's just go to that level first and then keep moving. All right. I like the, I like the incrementalist approach yep. here. I, and that's what I usually – that I, I'm okay with that idea. And right? I could see how that's – so like I could spout off about all these things because I'm not running for anything. And you're trying to – you've already got – the crazy base so yes. you can so you can go for the republicans who are a little like oh you're not one of those crazy libertarians are you and you can get go for them and campaign for them because your your base is solid they're gonna vote well in, as a general rule that's true um but i don't even think they're crazy i think they're important right i think the most radical the most anarchist libertarians are valuable in our movement because they keep us pointing in the right direction remember i see us as separate my job is the recruiter right I'm actually the recruiter. That's my job. My job is to bring them in, and hopefully the people who are hardcore libertarians don't get angry, and some of them do. They're like, Larry, you're not giving us libertarians. And my response is, then train them. I'm bringing you recruits. What you should be saying is, thank you, Larry. We'll take them from here. That's what you should be saying. But, but some but, of them but, get mad at me because the people I bring aren't always libertarians, and that's true. But how else do we grow? Okay, well, but, right? that, but that's a good question. So, so this is the basic question, which is, Okay, the views are valid. We a lot of people agree the party's never going to win ever. It seems, or at any time in the near future, not true. All not true. I, okay, I maybe we had seven victories last year in New York State, the least free state in the union, as rated by Cato. Seven. That's seven wins. Now, don't be wrong. That's not the presidency, but that's seven local wins. And in case you didn't know, two years before that, we had exactly zero. First year being an official party in New York State, seven wins. So what you're saying is factually incorrect. It is good that we had seven straight wins. If you add people who were on, on, on multiple lines, we had over 100 wins. But I'm only saying just people who enrolled just Libertarian, seven wins last year. That's amazing. All right. And so you're saying that could grow. Of course. I hope this year we'll get 21. I literally said I like incrementalism. That's the points. From zero to seven, 
That's amazing. Yeah. Now, if we have six this year, then I'm failing. But if we've got 14 or 21, now I'm rocking and rolling. Right now, I'm rocking and rolling. Next year, I got 48. I got 60. Now we're rocking and rolling. So I think we can win. I think you're right. The odds of us winning the presidency this year are slim to none. I get that. It's not a high chance to win the presidency. I got that. But wins, yes, we can. 100%. We can win. All right. I'm just saying. It's, and we've done it. We've already done it. So that, that was the whole point. I want to go to something that you brought up early on in our conversation. I'm going to come back to it. You brought up the idea of cancel culture. Yeah. Right? And this is the same idea. There are several things that, that, come to, that come to me when we talk about this. The idea of the second you do something wrong, insert wrong, whether wrong is failure, saying the wrong thing, dating the wrong person, having the wrong picture with somebody, whatever, right? All of a sudden now you are tainted and evil and need to go away forever. It's a concept that to me is actually un-American, right? America is about the second chance, right? The people who came to America came for second chances, except those in change, obviously. But without those who, not those in chains, came for a second chance. And then once chains were, were, were removed, they need to get a second chance too. So we are a nation of people who should get second chances. I think that's why we have our Bill of Rights, right? The idea that you don't get double jeopardy and all those types of things and illegal search and seizure. That, so we don't do that. But our culture has said zero tolerance. One mistake, the world ends. One mistake, that's the end. Yeah, or like, you know, you see, you know, not a political example, but you saw Kevin Hart was selected yep. to host the uh, the Oscars. It was like a dream come true for him. And they found a tweet from 2010 where he made, he, he admits it, he made just a stupid joke about his son potentially being gay and what he would do about it. And they fired him from the Oscars. Yes. And, you know, and he admits it was, a, it was a dumb joke. But again, how can you, there, there's no there's no statute of limitations on words anymore. Yeah, but and, what, and people what, what, change too. But what's happened is now we have two different sides, right? From this, you get one or two things. One, people who are afraid to do anything. Or two, Trump, who doubles down on everything. Now that I say he was gay, I said he was double gay. I mean, that's just boom, right? You just, yeah, and I hate them all. You just boom, doubles down. Or just says, I never said it. Here's the proof. Never said it. Here's the proof. Never said it. And I'm just, not just Trump, right? I'm using Trump because he's the most yeah. popular. But that's common. No, but, but Trump's a great example because he never allows anyone to take the frame from him. Yes. He will not defend. If you go, he's not going to defend anything. So then eventually there's nothing to attack. Correct. He, he just moved away. He well, just walked away. this goes back to what you talked about earlier about when you said you were in trouble. You kind of just came clean. I think just coming clean and always being honest. This goes back to Gary Johnson. I'm a big Gary Johnson fan, as you, as you probably know. Gary Johnson said this, he copied this thing you've heard before, which is just tell the truth. You don't have to remember anything, right? And that idea I think is right. You know, when I ran for the VP slot in 2016 to be Governor Johnson's uh, running mate, which I lost to Bill Weld, I did a nine minute video. And the nine minute video I did, it just put all my dirty laundry out. My mom was uh, in prison. I had gone broke. My mom was an addict. My father was dead when I was a kid. I'm adopted. I, just, I went through all my, I just gave it all. Here's, here's all my stuff, guys. My dirty laundry's right here. And my idea behind that was, now I'm free. Now I'm free. Larry, you failed. Yep. I told you that already. Larry, your mom was in jail. Yep. My mom's convicted felon. Yep. 100% told you that already. W what's the news? So just throw it out because I remember also that your failures in the past are okay. It's the current ones that aren't good, right? So as long as in the past, it's fine, right? So and also people people relate to the humanness of it. Yes, everyone wants to everyone wants to do that. There's a reason why confession brings communities together in yes, a church. Yes, absolutely. So, so 100%. you know, and also in a world, you know, we 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 definitely we're afraid. We're so afraid of failure. We don't want to be around people who fail. And 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 because of that fear, when you see someone else bravely do it, and brave's uh, the wrong word, maybe, but you just you, you say to yourself, ah, he he just gave me permission to to talk about my failure, to be honest. Yes, absolutely. To be yes. free. It's the old saying, and I'm I'm a big Star Trek fan, and I'll never forget that when um, Captain Kirk is on the Enterprise. You guys, I know I'm a geek. I'm sorry. When Captain Kirk is on the Enterprise, and he's going to fight the uh, one of the bad guys. I think it's I think it's the first movie. And the, someone says to him, you know, should we put our shields up? 
He says, no, don't put the shields up. Leave the shields down. Because the, the enemy alien, when the shields went up, took that as a battle stance and then would attack. So everyone else who came at this alien and put the shields up got killed by the alien. So Kirk said, no, no, keep him down. And then the alien talked to him. And my point I use all the time is, if you want to bring someone else's shields down, put yours down first. And very often, you can have a conversation. You don't have to fight. You can talk, right? I'm a big Star Trek geek, so that's where I got that from. But in any case. That's a good analogy. Um, yeah, I try, I try to use that. You did this, and then you lost the VP nomination. So what, I what did. happened? Um, thirty By 32 votes, not that I'm counting. I'm not counting. Why are you counting? I'm not counting, okay? Uh, I didn't know the number. Yeah, you're counting. <laughs> I'm not, you're counting. I'm not counting. Uh, anyway, so I lost by 32 votes, and um, then I just went on to support the party. Yeah. And I support the party until I ran myself in, in 2018. I'm supporting the party now. Yeah. I'm a party guy. I think the party is the right answer. I think it's the best answer for our future in America. And I support the party. And I, I support activists um, tremendously. I, I try to support them to the best of my ability. I don't always uh, I don't always agree with them. Doesn't matter. If they're locally making things happen, I'm in. Support them to the best of my ability. So anyway, I want to grab a couple call. Um, not calls, a couple of um, um, uh, things from uh, online if I could. Sure. Uh, a couple questions. This is, what is the single most important advice you would give to starting entrepreneurs? You know, it's funny how everyone says, what's the single mm -hmm. most? Okay, because there I isn't- I want the magic pill, James. Right, there isn't the single most. <laughs> yes. you, have to, you have to be creative all the time because you're going to have problems all the time. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to hold on to your money. Yeah, you okay. If I was going to say anything that's single, it's- Get a customer before you start a business. Mm. So many people have an idea and they think, oh, this idea is brilliant. I'm going to raise money from a venture capitalist. I'm going to quit my job and then I'm going to make this uh, uh, product. And then three years from now, after I've done all that, I'm going to finally find a customer. 90% of those businesses, 99% of those businesses are dead on arrival. Yeah. But if you, if you have a customer who wants to, you know, wear whatever special wearable computing watch that you make or whatever. If you have a customer already, then you know if you, that's why Kickstarter is so great. Kickstarter, you show, you throw up your idea, people could fund it and then they get your product if you, if, if you raise enough funding and you make the product and then, but you have a built-in customer base before you even sure. make the product. So a lot of companies, a lot of successful companies start out of Kickstarter, but I think always having customers, like every, every, Business I've started that has failed in flames. I had no customers mm -hmm. and I raised money. Every business where I raised no money but I was profitable from day one, those were successful and I made a ton of money from those. Customers yeah. give you money, not investors. You don't and make money from investors. What I would I would add to that, and that would be the most important thing is remember this important word: niche, 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 niche. The deepest niche you can get the best because your message can be the clearest, best chance of getting a customer to start. The problem is only people have this idea say, but my idea could save the world and everybody could use it. And I go, I'm sure everybody could use it. That's wonderful. You're amazing. But what specific niche can you market this thing to today so you can get a customer or customers or so you can create a message that an investor will go, I get that message or you get a message or an association or a group of people who go, we're in. Yeah, because you know, again, uh, you don't you don't want to be better. It, it's not good enough. Oh, so and so did this, but I'm going to make a better version. Mm -hmm. No one really knows that your version's better. <laughs> yes. The average person is not sophisticated about your product like you are. Mm -hmm. They can't tell the difference between ten percent better. That like no one knew Betamax was twenty percent better than VHS. No one even cared. Yep. And the Betamax kept saying, but wait, we're better. We're better. And then they just died. Yep. And 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 so the, the, the key is is to be different, to be in a niche, and to be different in a way that other people aren't the same different because then you have to be better than <laughs> right, those people, right. which, again, nobody could tell, so then it's random again. I mean, uh, Peter Thiel, actually, in the book I mentioned earlier, Zero to One, he, he talks about this. And so I asked him, you know, why were you – you know, wasn't Facebook just one of many social networks? There was MySpace, there mm, was yes. GeoCities, there was Friendster, there yep. was Tribes.com. Like, what wasn't wasn't Facebook just a, 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 a another social network? And he said, no, it was actually completely different. It was the first social network with confirmed identity, and I thought that was fascinating. So that was it was it was a nuanced kind of niche, but mm -hmm. 
there it was. He was right. Yeah. And we liked the fact that if I'm going to be Facebook friends with Larry Sharp, you're really Larry Sharp. Right. It's not like an anonymous person right. with a, this colorful background. It's kind of very, very formatted. It all looks the same. And, and it was confirmed identity. I like that. It's good. All right. Um, next one. I've wanted to start my own business, but the fear of failing has held me back. How do you overcome that fear? Try failing in simple ways. You got to, everything you want to do is think of it, think of failure like a muscle. And by the way, I didn't have this muscle. So when I failed, that's when I was suicidal. So this is how you avoid that is try to think of simple ways to fail. Tomorrow, when you go to Dunkin' Donuts for a cup of coffee, right at the cash register, when they charge you a dollar, just say, hey, can I have 10% off? And don't move a muscle in your face after that. They're going to look at you. They're going to be shocked. And they're going to say, what did you say? And just say, uh, can I have 10% off? And they're like, why do you want that? And d don't say it. Just say, I, I, I felt like asking for 10% off. They're going to be all confused. And by the way, they might give you 10% off. It's worked for me quite a few times where I've saved 10 cents here. I've saved up to $7 in a, in a Home Depot asking for 10% off. And... They said, they, the woman said to me, are you a student or a senior citizen? And I said, well, I'm 50. Does that count? <laughs> and, and she didn't know. So she kind of called a manager. No manager picked up. And so she gave me 10% off. So you never know. But most of the time when I've done this, I failed. And, and you learn. You learn to ask for things that are uncomfortable. You learn to deal with kind of this weird quasi social humiliation and failure. Here's another thing. So I perform stand up comedy at, at, at various clubs and I wanted to get better. So I went into a subway and every stop I switched subway cars and I did stand up comedy in the subway. So that is failure. Again, it's not failure like failing a business or it's not failure like, you know, a uh, failure of a marriage or whatever, but it's pretty humiliating when everybody is essentially spitting on you for an entire subway car ride and just practice little ways to fail over and over again. And they seem safe, but they're not because you're going to panic and you're going to be scared and you're going to be humiliated, but you, you practice bit by bit. But for real failure of like losing all your money, there is no, there is no practice for that ultimately because it, it sucks. It's horrible. Just don't lose all of your money. There's three skills to money, <laughs> making it, your money. Ke making it, keeping it, growing it. So if you're, even if you're good at making it, it's a completely different skill to keep it because suddenly you think you're the smartest person in the world because you made it. So now you're just going to spend it everywhere and invest it everywhere and you'll lose it. Just don't do that. There's no real good practice for that. But everything else you can practice by, and it's fun to ask for 10% off or talk to random to strangers the, uh, on the street. The handsome man discount. That's what I used to do. Yeah, you, yeah. you, and I would sometimes you, get it. They'd give me the. You'll get it, Larry. Discount. You're, you're a they handsome guy. Discount. You're keto. You're, you're, yeah. you're all good. There we go. So you know, I, I look at fear in a very different way. Most people, uh, say don't be afraid, or say fear is what is the thing, false evidence appearing real, and do something cool like that. And I say no, fear is very smart. Fear is a good thing, right? But the difference is, for most people, they go from fear to action. That's the problem. Fear should spur thought, right? If I'm getting ready to jump out of an airplane, I should think, I'm jumping out of an airplane, I'm afraid. Okay, let me think. Why am I jumping out of an airplane, right? Do I have a parachute? Is it on fire? Good idea, jump out. What? Well done, right? I've got a parachute, it's on fire. Do I not have a parachute? It's not on fire? Bad idea, don't jump out of the airplane. So I want fear to spur thought. If, spear, if fear spurs thought, now we're rocking and rolling. The problem is we go right to action. We have to train our brain, I think, and I learned this in the Marine Corps. I learned this when I was, I'm a veteran, seven years in the Marine Corps. They, they teach you, they give you training, scenario training. Do the same thing again and again and again so that your training kicks in when you're afraid, mm. right? That's the goal, right? Your training kicks in when you're afraid. I think this is also a muscle. You have to be able to handle fear and fear needs to trigger thought. It doesn't need to trigger action. We have the idea, the, the, it's a joke that uh, Judge Jim Gray, who was Gary Johnson's first uh, vice presidential nominee in 2012, he, he always told me, he said, people always say, don't just stand there, do something, right? He's the verse. Don't just do something, stand there. That's what he actually says. He's like, just think for a second before you act. And I think there is the key. When you're feeling afraid, it should spur a thought. And the number one thing I want to, to spur is what is the most probable outcome? 
And when you speak, when I teach leadership, I discuss this concept tremendously because people are natural optimists or natural pessimists. And the pessimist always says, when I say, what's the most probable outcome? They will always say this. Well, worst case scenario is, I didn't ask worst case scenario. What's most probable? The optimist will always go, oh my God, imagine if we, I didn't ask to imagine. I asked what's the most probable. So I have to repeat the question often. I call this broken record. I just keep repeating the question. If you're under 30, that's a, I don't know, a, a broken MP3 file. Is that corrupted? MP3? Whatever. I don't know what you, you don't, you know what records are. So anyway, so broken records, you do the same thing again and again and again. So I ask the guy or gal, I say, you know, what's the most probable outcome? Worst case scenario. Now I'm asking what usually happens. Well, if it's really bad, I'm not saying it's really bad. What usually happens? Well, usually this happens. So that's the most probable? Yeah, it's the most probable. That thought process is what you have to start to build in your own mind. What's the most probable? What usually happens? So 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 far we gave two answers, but and maybe let's play with this for a second. So one is practice fear so you kind of know that you know how to deal with the emotion when it hits your body, you know how to recognize it. The other thing is train train away the fear so that if I'm combining what you said, the most probable outcome will actually be an outcome likely to be good for you. If you've trained the way- It may not be. If the most likely income is wrong, then walk away, but walk away because, don't run, calmly walk away because it makes sense to walk away. Right. Because because you've trained to know that, to ask yourself Correct. that and to know that and to build that muscle. And then the, the third thing I'm going to add to that is because you mentioned that that fear is often irrational, which it often is. Yep. Like, like, for instance, the fear of starting a business is irrational because- Every wealthy person on the planet pretty much started a business at some point. So so the fear of starting a business is probably mm-hmm. irrational. So the, the the third thing to say is is every now and then when you're feeling real fear and you sense that this might not be rational, just it's, it sounds cliche, but just tell yourself, hey, this is going to be all right. Because in the long run, it really will be. Uh, you know, and, and, and a lot of times fear, like Larry was saying, really is irrational. And, and you have to just tell remind yourself that, that hey, this is going to be all right. It's not that big a deal. I'm just going to move forward. But then for starting a business, and like Larry was saying, you know, induce thought, you have to ask yourself, and this is a little different than what's the most probable outcome. Ask yourself all the things that can go wrong that are risks and try to take all the risks out. So we talked sure. earlier about have a customer before you start a business. Mm-hmm. That removes the risk of getting customers. Uh, you know, have a safety net. Like I kept my job while I was starting a business at the same time. That was my safety net. I'm not, I, was a, I had customers. I had a safety net. I had good people working for me during the day so I could work all night. So you remove one by one. You, you identify the risks and, and you remove them and that helps you deal with the fear. So that's like four different ways to I love avoid that. fear. That's a ton of stuff. I love it. All right, got to go into an LP one. Sorry that this is uh, this is a libertarian leaning show, so people do ask uh, libertarian party questions. I'm I'm going to answer libertarian. I also. love it. Let's do it. All right. Um, I was going to run against you for governor of New York. I love it. You know, 2022 is <laughs> coming, my friend. No, I'm giving it to you. Okay, I love it. Excellent. It's, you all can right. have it. It's all yours. I love it. I will be coming to you for a check then, so don't lose your money in 2021. I just, I, what? How, yeah, don't, don't lose your money. I you gave can you lose your money in 2023. Just don't lose it in 2021, I, 2022. I just gave you 100 North Korean won. Don't I, spend it all in one place. I, I, will, I can only spend it in one place. That's true. the problem. I literally can only spend it in one place. True. They won't so, let you spend it. Exactly, yes. <laughs> um, so um, how would you recommend bringing people into the LP without compromising your personal values? I agree with some candidates, but feel they're making a circus of the party and scaring people away. Um, this is a great question. I, I don't think there's one or the other. I think you can do both, right? I, I feel like I'm principled. Some people would disagree, but I feel like I'm principled and I don't I try not to scare people away. I try to make sure that every single policy I come up with when I'm running or helping others come up with never increases taxes, never grows government, always shrinks government. Um, and it's always voluntary and never uses force. And I think these are my principles that I retain in every policy I create, whether that's fixing the MTA or whether that's overseas policies or whatever it is. I'm always trying to advocate for a smaller government, never bigger government, never more taxes, and never force, always voluntary. I think you can do it. If you're thinking about who you can support, which is the second question, are certain people making a, uh, a circus out of the party? I think they are, but... This is another issue I, I learned when I was running for governor. When you're losing, and this is, I learned this from Marine Corps, but I used when I was governor. When you're losing is when you gamble, right? If you're winning, don't gamble. 
right? I'm winning. Don't gamble, right? The, I'm winning the war. I'm winning the battle. Don't gamble. I got this. Just keep going slowly and win the battle. When I'm losing, roll the dice. What, what's the uh, other opportunity, uh, the other option? I lose worse. I still lose. So when I ran for governor, when, when my team would say, hey, Larry, should we do X? I'd go, yes. In fact, the funny thing that happened, I was so loose in my way of, of my team. Very often, I would get a, a message and go, ooh, I said that? I'm a genius. Well, what's the craziest no thing idea. you said yes to? Um, I think the craziest thing I said yes to, uh, I could think what it was, um, I did CrossFit. And we did a go live CrossFit. And I just said, okay, I guess I'm CrossFitting today. That was it. Literally, I just put on sweats and I went. Um, I also, yeah, I think, and I, I threw a, a, a pitch, uh, the first pitch for the Utica Blue Sox in Utica and had no prep. So I think those were two things. I did throw a strike, by the way. It is on YouTube. I'm a Yankee fan, born and raised in the Bronx. So yes, so yeah, I'm a Yankee fan. I can throw a pitch. So um, I think of those two. But my, my, I, I think you gamble. And are some people making making a circus? I think they are. But I'm not necessarily against it, if that makes any sense. If we get some more people in, if we should roll the dice is what I'm saying. We're losing. I mean, it's not like we're all of a sudden 45% of the population. We're probably 3% of the electorate if we're lucky. So, you know, my take on this is the same for any party, really, which is that you don't – just because you sign up for a party doesn't mean you just ordered everything on the menu. Yes, correct. So, so like – for instance, you could be a Democrat without believing in all the things that Democrats sure. believe in. You yeah. could be a Republican, but still be pro-choice and anti-gun and whatever. You, you have choice. You're just trying to decide who's going to be the best ruler of the world, who's going to make intelligent decisions in times of trouble. And and in general, you agree with the philosophy, but you don't, it's going to be, it's sort of stupid how polarized every party's become where, oh my God, I'm a, I'm a this. So I got to now believe in every single thing right. or else they're going to kick me out of the party. Like that's what's happened now is that you, you're, you're forced to vote down every issue in party lines. And, and, and I think a lot of people even feel that way about libertarians. Like, oh yeah. You're like not a, a real libertarian. You're not a real libertarian. Yeah, you like don't a, believe like, in everything uh, I believe in. Right, yes. like, like every I, when I, I was in graduate school for computer science, and I noticed with computer scientists, everything had to be a one. They had to have an algorithm. Everything had to be, have a one or a zero answer. So that meant they were either super liberals or super libertarians. Because mm. then, if you're a super libertarian or a super liberal, you're gonna have someone's gonna give you any question at all, and you'll know whether it's a one or a zero just Got by it. that. And and it, there was no nuance at all. And and but to rule the world, you've got to be nuanced. You gotta you gotta straddle you know some some landscape of philosophies, not just one philosophy. Or you could not rule the world. Yeah, that's true too. You don't have to run for president. <laughs> you could not rule the just world. Just stay at home. I gotta yes. binge watch Dracula on Netflix tonight. I I do like that. <laughs> um, so uh, all those are options. Um, let's see. Uh, this interesting one. This is a not LP related. This is what's the best advice you've received? Uh, the best advice I've received, I would have to say, I mean, again, it's like the single, the single most important yep. thing. I want the magic pill, James. Just give it to me. You know, I was when I, I and maybe it was the same for you. Like when I was a kid, my parents worked all the time, so I never really saw them. They they never really gave me yeah. Our any generation advice. Generation were latchkey uh, kids. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't. And then my parents had fun on their own on the weekends. Like I never saw them, so they never gave me any advice. I never really had any mentor in business or school or anything like that. I kind of had to figure out things after I lost everything. Like what what the hell happened to me and. I think that the best advice is what we were talking about earlier. Get back, always get back and ask yourself, am I taking care of my my core health, physical health? Am I eating well, sleeping well, moving well? Emotional health, am I taking care of my relationships? Creative health, am I coming up with ideas every day just as practice? And even spiritual health, am I not trying to control the things I can't control? And if I just ask myself that at the end of every day, that's the best I can do. That I can't really do more than that. And I don't know anything about any other advice. The best advice I've ever received was from a sales uh, VP I had when I used to sell Craftmatic adjustable beds. I used to go door to door to sell beds. What's a Craftmatic? Those are the, are the beds that go up and down. Okay. This is like 25 years ago, so they don't even have those anymore. But it used to be, this is back in the day where you'd still call the number and we come to your house. It was back in those days. I'd go to people's houses I'd never met three or four a day and sell these beds. That's what I would do. Um, and 
there was a guy who is interesting story. He was a guy who was from Saudi Arabia. He was Mohammed, but he called him Mo. And he would be in front of our our sales meetings, and he would he was very aggressive and and nasty and angry and just vulgar. And many people were turned off by him. But I'd spent years in the Marine Corps. That was leadership that I was accustomed to. So his vulgarity didn't mean anything. I was like, oh, I'm listening. And he's giving us gold. I'm like saying, this guy's brilliant. He's giving us gold on how to sell, how to move people. And it was amazing. And But people couldn't hear him. They were just they hated him. He was, he was nasty. They didn't like him. So after the, the, the meeting, I go off and I say, Mo, help me out. You know, I, I'm trying to do this. I'm not doing that well. And the best advice he gave me, which I still keep, he doesn't even know. he if, if he was watching, he wouldn't remember me or even know he did this. So he doesn't even know he was my mentor. But he said, remember something, everything's emotional. I never forgot that. Everything I teach is about emotional intelligence. Everything I talk about is about emotional. Everything I talk about when I run for a governor is emotional. Everything's emotional. I, I agree That's what that. he said, and that never left me. And that's, that's really important advice because even in business, you would think, oh, it's all about the product. It's nope. all about you know money and this and that. It's When I'm talking with my partners about a, a deal say or a sale mm -hmm. we're all the what we 90 percent of what we talk about is the psychology yes like how do what's this person thinking about how is he feeling how are we going to talk to him well i want to be clear on this it doesn't mean everything's a hundred percent emotional of course not 90 percent. but everything has an emotional component yeah. that's what he meant he didn't mean that look the bed's got to work right the product has to exist right so that it's not a hundred percent emotional but people often think no it's logical it costs this amount of money it does the job the person buys it here's the formula no, that matters, right? But also emotional. When I'm prior to 2008, I was doing a lot of training with investment banks, Credit Suisse, uh, Deutsche Bank, Royal Bank of Scotland. I was doing a lot of training for these guys. And when I was doing that training, they would say, Larry, it's about the deal. And I'd say, it is about the deal, but it's never only about the deal. Right. It's the deal and something. And they would go, oh, yeah, it is. Every time. Well, it's never only about the deal. And I'd say, that's the emotional piece. And for some deals, that's that much. And for some, it's huge. But there's always an emotional piece. And that's what I would bring up with them. And to this day, I would say at the highest levels, and you know this, at the highest levels, it is far more about trust than it is competence. Trust, and, and, and this is related, and friendship. Yes. When you do a deal with someone, it's not that they just want your, your deal they kind of want to be friends with you. Yes. You're winning them. They want to have another person to call at three in the morning when they're sad. Yes. <laughs> and yes. that's why they want to do a deal with you. Yes. And that's part of the conversations that you you have. And then, you know, I'm, I'm curious what you think about this, because now when I'm thinking specifically of sales, there's one piece of advice I always rely on. And it's funny to use the word advice on high stakes sales. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say you're selling a big deal or sure. a big piece of real estate or or you're selling your company or whatever. Absolutely. I, I always- I've been part always. I was an officer in the public company twice. So 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 I go to the other person, the other side of the, the table, and I say, let me, let me ask you a question. I've been working so hard on this and building the product or building the company or building the team or whatever. I, I, that's what I've been doing. You're, an, and I'll say, you're the expert. You're like the grandmaster of deals or this type of sales or negotiations. I'm just an amateur. Let me ask you advice. What should I do in this situation? Because mm -hmm. then, and this is your emotional core. I'm giving them status. I'm Absolutely. showing them respect. I'm I'm emphasizing how hard I work to create the type of product that they would want. Yep. And what are they going to do? Negotiate against themselves? Like they're going to have to give me good advice because I just gave them status. I completely agree. There are two parts that you did that were amazing. The first thing is I'm very similar, but I might change my words a little bit. I say, if you were me, what would I? What would you do? That's the only change, but I do exactly the same thing. I just say, if you were me, what would you do? That's the only difference. Otherwise, I say exactly the same thing. But what you're doing is the root of anger is a perceived lack of respect and or a perceived lack of control. And when you say you're the grandmaster, you're giving respect. And when you say, what would you do? You're giving control. So how can they be angry at you? Right. Now, if there's any anger, it's obviously posturing. You right. know in negotiation that the person is now posturing because you're giving them no reason to be angry. And if they give you advice that they perceive might be bad, they don't want to lose status with you. Correct. And you just gave them all the status. Yes. And I find that technique works extraordinarily well. Now, I don't know how well, I'm curious what you think, how well would it work on lower stakes situations? Like if I'm selling a bed, let's say, and they say no. As a general rule, no. Because yeah. remember, in that case, they want you to be the authority figure.
Yeah, I see. Right. So there's some line where it goes from high stakes to low stakes. Correct. Uh, the, the the difference here is 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 it enter- I call it enterprise sales. Right. Is enterprise sales is business to business, big sales, company to company, business yeah. to business versus consumer to consumer, which is different. In today's world, and I think Daniel Pink brought it up probably best in his book to sell as human. The the sales rep of of old, that sales rep's job was very often to educate. Right. The, uh, let me tell you about this cool cup. By the way, cool Shortway Cup guys, if you're gonna buy one, head over to shortway.com. They are there for you to purchase. Uh, so yes, um, you, I'm gonna tell you about how cool this cup is. It's awesome. Now your job as a sales rep actually isn't to do that because they have internet, they have Google, they often know more than you do when they, they have say AI, that. they have data. They have AI, they have data. Your job is to curate. Your job is to say, hmm. yeah, there's all this information, but for you, this is what you need. This is your information. Your job is to curate information, which means you have to be an expert. It's the old saying I'm sure you've heard, there's a, a joke where a guy goes to a machine. A machine is broken down, and they call this expert to fix the machine. So the guy walks up and goes, yeah, I can fix it. How much? $11,000. He goes, $11,000? Yep, I'll fix it, $11,000. So he walks up a part of the machine with a hammer and goes, bang, on, on the machine. <laughs> Boom, it starts working. They go, $11,000 for that? He goes, yeah, $1,000 to swing the hammer, $10,000 to know where to swing the hammer. <laughs> That's great. Yes, and that concept I think is is the way that we have to be. We have to we have to be the curator and know what they need to know, right? And particularly when it's to customers, right? To 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 the to the individual. But see, what's what's interesting is because you brought up like uh, you know internet and digital, and if you if you look at AI and data, they that do exactly is, that. That's the curation, correct? Because yes. like so, we know someone who's in the the car selling business, mm-hmm. and so there's so much data. Like they could tell you. When was the last time you bought a car? Yep. How frequently you buy a car? Which dealers you usually buy a car? How much negotiation you do? Yes. Where you buy insurance? AI is a curator, it? right? Yes. And so then they'll know they'll sell that information, that AI curated information to dealerships, and then the the dealership doesn't have enough salespeople. They'll do a thousand auto calls that day, and just whatever five leads come in, those are the leads. Yes. And it's all done by AI until that point. Absolutely, that they're the curators. Exactly right. Right. Today's world, when it comes to sales, is curating. And that's the whole issue. That's why if you niche, 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 you know exactly what the people are looking for. You increase the odds of getting that customer, right? And less time you're spending. You want your, people will often tell you, and if anybody's starting a business, this is an entrepreneur show, you will hear people say, I'll get you more leads. I'll get you more phone calls. That's not better sales. They'll say, I'm a sales guru. I'll give you a sales engine and I'll get you more leads. That's not better, better marketing. Better sales is only one of three things or a combination. One, you have a higher close rate. So when I see 10 people, I used to close two, now I close three. That's better sales, right, if, if that happens. Two, I have a shorter sales cycle. It used to take me two days to close a client, now it takes me one day to close a client. That's better sales if you close the, the sales cycle. Or three, I'm getting more hit, more dollar per close, right? I used to close at 10 bucks, now I'm closing at 20 bucks. If one of those three things isn't happening, they're not helping you with sales. AI helps that. Hmm. AI either gets you to a higher price point because more value was built, so the price is higher, or you're curating who shows up so more people buy. You have the, 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 the tire kicker doesn't show up. And you're giving them more the things that they want. They, they look less. Your sales cycle is closed. So AI does all those things. AI actually does give you better sales because it affects all three of those. So by the way, two things. I, I like how now in this conversation we both referenced the prior – the first question, which is, what is the one book we'd recommend? I said, Zero to One, <laughs> yes. tell you, you said To Sell as Human by Daniel Pink. So it, it, those books actually did turn out to be useful for us and not Absolutely. just useless books. Yep. Uh, uh, second, it is interesting. The whole category of sales advice, I think, is different than you know, the category of advice to be a better entrepreneur, but it's strongly related. Yeah, sales absolutely. is an important part of, you have to be a good salesperson to be a good entrepreneur, basically. But revenue solves a lot of problems, Yeah, I'm saying. <laughs> so, so revenue solves a lot yeah. of problems, yeah, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really only, does. It's only when you're really kind of down and out or dealing with, you know, often businesses have to pivot so that they could be, and you have to be creative what to pivot to, and that's how you get revenues. You have to ha- you have to have some internal strength in the worst situations so you can get those revenues. Absolutely, yes. So I'm um, sorry. Guys, by the way, I'm sorry. We have to wait so much. If you want to join the program, please feel free to give us a call if you like. Happy to have you on board. 573-427-5463. Please give us a buzz. We're happy to chat. I know some of you want to talk about LP. Some of you want to talk entrepreneurship. We don't mind. You know, it's it's the sharp way. It's whatevs. All good. And, and, All right. and I already addressed my mom, but if either of my two sisters who also don't speak to me anymore want to call in, 
I'd be fine with that as well. There we go. So family members are welcome. So yes, um, I have a question for you specifically. Are you considering running for any offices in the future? No, uh, I mean, you know, it's an interesting story. Someone, and this was a, the, the 2018 election or whatever for governor, some random person wrote an article. I kind of forget who wrote an article saying James Altucher should run for the governor of the Libertarian Party. And I completely ignored it and I wasn't taking it seriously. And then you called and that's when we yes, had lunch. <laughs> absolutely, yes. So it was just totally this random thing. One time... I did 2014 Congress, uh, a little upstate in the Hudson Valley near like uh, Cold Spring, New York. I was considering running for Congress and I the, the candidate appeared weak to me for a variety of reasons. And I thought there was a reasonable chance. And then something interesting happened, which is that I heard through the grapevine that this one potential presidential candidate wanted to endorse me. And so I had a call with his team and they were very interested, but I had to hire for like 40,000 a month, their pollster. And of I had course. to also hire uh, their, the campaign manager's political advice company, consulting company yep. for another like 60,000 a month. Yep. And I'm like, why do I need to do this? I'm just going to say what I feel. I don't need to know poll and know what everyone else feels. I'm going to say what my opinion is. And then people could decide. And, and it's and, a money grab. Yeah. And then most of the politics is a money grab. Right. And then another person said, well, you're never going to get the nomination if you don't like wine and dine these three judges. Yep. And I'm like, you know what? This is a lot more complicated than I thought, so I wimped out. But I, I'm a firm believer: if you if you want to try anything, it doesn't hurt to experiment and take small steps. You know, if you want to run for Congress, start saying your views and start saying you're running for Congress there and see what happens. It's an experiment. But uh, instead of ha instead of running for Congress, now I have this story about running for Congress. There we go. So we almost got it. All right, this is a little bit, this is kind of a mix. This is kind of business and also not, but how can I avoid the damage someone can do to my business by going after me on social media? You ignore. You completely ignore it. If you ignore something, it goes away in 24 hours. If you fight it or defend yourself, you just reset the clock for another 24 hours. So, And I see people all day long defending and they never, ever stop because they keep resetting the clock. Yep. But but most people are not looking at your everybody's tweets. Yep. They don't even know that you're being attacked. Absolutely. But you feel it and you see it because you're hitting your notifications. It seems yep. like it's everywhere, but no one else is seeing it at all. And even if they are, they're going to forget it in 24 hours yep. or, or a week or however long it takes. You're going to move past it. They can't really get you so much in social media. And the worst thing you do is, is defend because then you're basically participating in their conversation and you're not starting your own conversation. Oh, uh, I, I couldn't have said it better that you will find that I get hammered literally weekly. Someone says something bad about me. Uh, I was telling yeah. you, if you want to run for office, I would say, can you accept that people are going to blatantly lie about you and you will have no recourse? If they go, no, I said, don't run for office because that's going to happen. Well, well, so people lie about me all the time. And what I do is what you just said. If it's a, a, a harsh lie, usually one of my team or myself will say one or two things to say. This is what we meant or didn't do or did do. Then we ignore it. And it goes away. They, yeah. And people, people, the funny thing, what I love is when people attack me on social media is they always think they're going to get me. They're not the first. You're not the first. And you won't be the last. But it's just how it works. There's going to be someone else who hates me, who decides they're going to say some stuff about me. They're going to do it again. And I will probably ignore them. And, and it will go away eventually. And by the way, if if any time you stick out, you're going to be hammered. So if you're running for political office, yep. there's going to be someone who's going to try to hammer you down. Yep. But here's two things you really don't want to do. So let's just think about it in another way. You don't want to lend your entire audience of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to this to this kid in his mom's basement with three followers. <laughs> yes. Like he's trying to borrow your audience. He's doing anything he can to borrow Absolutely. your audience. You don't want to give it to him. Second, if they have millions of followers and you have 10,000, let them attack you all they want Absolutely. because that's free marketing. But those people aren't attacking you because they're on to bigger and better things. Absolutely. And so I, in either way, it's no, no win for you unless, unless they're attacking you, but there's no reason to really, stop them from attacking you, then it's only a good thing. Well, the other thing that, that I try to do, and I think I've, I, I'm still doing it, is I create a lot of content. I create so much content that if someone searches for the, the bad thing, they're going to get all my good stuff. It's hard. You'd yeah, have to know point. exactly what – the solution is dilution, right? You have to know mm. exactly what you're looking for to beat me up. You can't just go, Larry Sharp, bad stuff. 
You're not going to find anything because I have so much content that I put out, right? My team puts out content every day on all types of media. I put this out on all types of media. I cut this up and people, I have tons of, I keep putting out content. If you go, Larry's bad because of this thing, they would have to know exactly what they're looking for to find it. Otherwise, they're never going to find it. Yeah, all, all good techniques. Yeah. I remember one time I did respond to a bunch of haters and this was like a Saturday night at 1.30 a.m. And I was getting so upset. I don't know why I was getting so upset this one night. Because you're human. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's just it. It's, yep. it's painful. And I said, okay, here's my phone number. Anyone who has a problem with me, call me. And then for the next 12 hours, people from all around the world were calling <laughs> me. And they were like, the first response was, oh, I didn't think you would pick up. Oh yeah, hey, it's nice talking to you. I'm actually a big fan. I just, I don't know. I just had this one issue, blah blah blah. Even though they were like screaming and cursing, like on Twitter, and I realized after the end of that 12 hours, I had just completely wasted 12 hours of my life. <laughs> yes, so. yes, it's funny. Well, and the same thing, you know. As I, many people know that I have a team that helps me with my social media, and I'm not always responding. Right, there sometimes the responses that people get on my social media aren't me responding. They're my team responding in my name. I don't always respond, but I try to. And people sometimes get shocked. They'll tweet me. I'll happen to get on Twitter and I respond. And it'll actually be me. I just respond. Hey, what do you want? What's going on? We'll talk. I've had people just call me up. I say, let me give you my phone number. They'll call me up. We'll just talk. I do it. I try to do it often because I don't want to be that guy. And again, I'm not an A-level celebrity at all. I'm a, I'm an, I'm a G level, right? I'm a very low level F level celebrity, but in a small pond, right? There aren't that many of us, if that makes any sense. So in a small pond, people will often ask me and I'll sometimes just talk to them, pick up the phone, talk, stop by. I've stopped by people's houses. Um, that, it's You're, fine. You you have restraining orders. Only a couple of restraining orders. Only on seven. <laughs> it's not bad. Seven. And none of them are in New York State, so I'm fine. Right. So yes, yeah. So no. But I mean, I, I don't actually mind. I mean, if, if people want to do it, one thing I do often is um, when I travel to other states for conventions, I will purposely not take an Uber and ask if someone wants to pick me up from the airport, so we can now spend time and talking in the car while they're going to the the event yeah, or that's back. Good. So I'll often on purpose. So I just do that kind of thing. So I'm trying to be that guy who. You know, when social media people uh, attack me, very often the people who support me will attack them instead. It's very common. I'm trying to be the guy that can still be touchable when some people think I'm not. People when I live in New York City and they live all over the country, they think I've never talked to Larry Shaw, but I, he lives in New York City. No, no, it's, you text me and you, you might actually get something. It does work. So anyway, I, 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 I'm the guy who actually, and I learned this, believe it or not, from a banker years ago. Um, he was a very uh, a wealthy guy who used to invest. And so he literally took his Sundays, every Sunday, I forgot, it was Sunday morning, whenever it was, this is 12 years ago, more, before the crash, so probably about 15 years ago. Um, and he would take his Sunday mornings, and that was his time to call people. And people mm -hmm. would he'd set up a time, and he'd call people. Just, how you doing? Talk for 10, 15 minutes. And he'd talk to people, because people always wanted his ear. Because they thought, if I, if I give him the right idea, he'll give me a million dollars, or whatever. They all thought that. So he said, I'm not going to be a jerk, and not talk to anybody. I'm just going to say, I've got a four-hour block every Sunday morning, first come, first serve. All right, that's reasonable. So that's what he did. So I try to be that whenever I can get on. I, I still have a work. I still work. I still have to make money. I'm still consulting. I'm still teaching and training. So I'm still, you know, doing that stuff. So I don't have time. I can't always do it. But if I'm on a break, literally, I could be in a class. I have a 10 minute break. I'll go online. Oh, someone, and I'll respond on Facebook or I'll respond on Twitter. I'll just, I'll, it'll be me. I'll literally just do it. I'll take a phone call during lunch and just talk about stuff. So it's, it's interesting. I found people who sometimes are in trouble will call me and want me to somehow coach them through something because they, they, this, they see me online so much, they think, Larry will have a good idea because he talks all the time. He's a talker. So they think that I'll give them some advice or something. And do you? Do you give them good advice? I <laughs> always try to help. It's not always the best advice, but I, what I, you guys call me, I tell you, I tell you what I think. All right, I'm, I'm going to call you the next time I'm, I'm broke and contemplating suicide and my kids hate me and, 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 and no, it's no, all bad. I, I'm I, giving you I, a call. I literally have dealt with people who are thinking think about suicide. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm a veteran, and many of my veteran friends have had trouble and issues and concerns. People in the LP have had trouble. I, I absolutely deal with that. You were, you were a veteran during the uh, the first Iraq war. First did Gulf you, War. Yep. Did, you go to, did you go there? The war was over too fast. Uh, I was literally give you ready time? To, to deploy, and the war ended. It was a 100-hour war. Literally, it was a 100-hour war. Huh. The war ended before I got a chance to deploy. So, no, I was, I was, I'm not a combat veteran. I'm not. But, um, you know, I deal with people, and of course I do. I'm not going to just let people who are in trouble, right? And one of the people who helped me tremendously with dealing with that, it was two people who helped me tremendously with dealing with people who are suicidal. One of them was a guy named Mark Goulston. Do you happen to know Mark Goulston? No. He wrote the book, Just Listen. <laughs> um, and he wrote the book, uh, Talking to Crazy. Brilliant guy from um, California. I think, I think it's LA, if I, I think it's LA. 
Very smart, brilliant guy. Um, used to be a hostage negotiator and just knows how to talk to people. And we chatted here or there a couple times. I read his books and I, I met him a couple times. And you know, I listened deeply what he was telling me. And I, he really gave me a lot of insight into how to deal with people who are in trouble, who aren't hearing you, right? Who don't get it or who have put their brain in a certain spot, whose brain's been hijacked by their emotions and things of that sort. Helped me tremendously. So I use it whenever I possibly can. I yeah, well, what did he say? Um, there are many things, but the, the basic concept is stop telling people stuff, hmm. right? I don't, because when you tell people stuff, they don't hear you, right? The, uh, you, it's, I use questions for almost everything. In fact, my leadership tech, techniques that I teach, I literally teach leadership. When I teach it, I teach you can lead a company without giving one order. Hmm. Everything's questions. It's leadership. Through, I call it, this is from him in theory, I call it leadership through questions. By the way, I think this was the help you gave me on my presentation. I think that this is what ah, you were telling me. Yes, back there we go. Lunch. See, there we go. Now you remember. Yeah. There we go. It's leads to questions. It's, you can you can lead without with because this is what it's his post industrial leadership, right? Leadership back in the day was all about you're the right cog in the right wheel. That's it, right? You're, I'm a cog in the machine. Now I don't require that. I don't need arms and legs anywhere near as much as I used to need. What I need now is your intellect. I need your your creativity. I, I need your initiative. I need all those things. I can't order that of you. You have to voluntarily give that. You have to have buy-in and ownership. And that's only through you agreeing to have buy-in and ownership. If I don't get you to buy in and have ownership, I'm not going to get all of you. A goal of, as a leader is to make sure that I get the maximum amount of your brain I possibly can get every single day. That's my goal as a leader. Can I get the maximum amount of your brain and your brain, the maximum amount every single day? If I do that, I'm winning. If I don't do that, I'm losing. That's my goal. Your brain, number one. That's leadership through questions. I'm going to yes, remember that. Absolutely. That's that's the goal. See, I knew I helped you in something. I forgot yeah. what it was. I gave you because I'm always doing it, right? I didn't know what I did, but I know I always do it. So I'm sure I said something. So, yes, I, we went way off topic. Sorry, guys, we went way off topic. So, yes. Um, let's see. Um, this is an interesting one, though. Um, how can uh, how can you handle – I'm sorry. Have you had a truly problematic employee? How did you deal with it? Yeah, and the and, well, there's different levels of problematic. But let's say – so I, if an employee has what I call the disease, meaning behind you could tell that behind your back, they don't agree with anything you're saying or they're making fun of the clients or they're making fun of your partners or whatever, like truly problematic where, you know, when they take a cigarette break with other employees, they're spreading the disease to them. Yep. You have to eliminate that person. You you, you have to cut the cancer out before it grows. It's only going to grow. It's never going to suddenly yeah, but there's disappear. there's a massive problem that's growing when it comes to that, particularly in New York State, but all over. You fire somebody, you're getting sued. Yeah, but that's why, okay. You're getting sued. It doesn't matter if it's real or not. You fire somebody, they're going to say, James is a bad boss and gave me a horrible environment and right. he's beat me up, yelled at me, whatever. They so that's why things. that's why there's a great flip side of this too, which is if you're an employee and you have a bad boss and they fire you, you say, no, we're going to negotiate. <laughs> yeah, that's so, true. Yes. So, so you, you should always negotiate being fired. But again, if you're, if you have a problematic employee and, and, and look, if you have a small business, by the way, just have contractors, don't have employees. But if you have a pro problematic employee. Go Governor Cuomo's literally stopping that. Really? He is destroying that. It was in a state of the state. He is literally going out of his way to destroy contractors and destroy the gig economy. He literally said that because he thinks he doesn't understand that that's how we all grow. That's and that's how, how the economy is going. That's right how now. the economy. He has no clue. That's exact. He is destroying the state. I was in this is a little off topic, but but your points valuable. You just can't do it in the state anymore. The state is being destroyed. I was in D.C. about three months ago. I'm seeing a, a government blockchain association event. And during one of the breaks, I had people who were sitting there who weren't from New York City who were talking about the New York State, New York City business attrition rate, how fast businesses are leaving New York City because they simply can't function here anymore. It is it is is detrimental to – they can't function because they get one bad employee, it's collapse. End it. Yeah. Uh, I agree with that. It's like turning into like a, another France or something. Yes. But – that is the only way to really deal with a bad employee. You have to figure out some way to put distance between that employee and the rest of your employees because cancer spread, you know, it'll spread. It's a, it's like a, a contagion. It'll spread like a disease. Well, you know, when I have, bad, and I've had many bad employees, um, the, the number one thing is because when I've come aboard, when I've come aboard for the organization, um, I, 
I didn't hire them, right? I'm a big fan of hire, hire slow, fire fast, right? Slow hiring. People say, but if I hire slow, I'll lose good talent. Then lose good talent. Because if somebody says, well, they'll go someplace else, let them go. I want them to come to this job because they want this job. The vast majority of people simply let their life be run by inertia. I take this job because this job's in front of me. James said he had a job, so I grab it. That's, I do not want that guy. I'd rather have no one. But if you're thinking intelligently, you're actually being proactive in your hiring, right? As you do your old chart of your own job, of your business, you're seeing in advance who you need to hire. So you begin hiring before you need them. You begin the hiring process prior to needing them, right? Creating the right, the, the right uh, 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 documentation to, to get it going, all those things, right? And you knowing what the job description is or the job posting, all those things. You get emotional words to draw people in who actually want to be part of your company. You start that early. It should take at least three months to hire anybody. If it doesn't, you're making a mistake. Mm. At least three months, if not six months, mm. but at least three months to hire anybody. But Larry, they'll leave you. Good. Let them. Because, you know, there's an interesting broader thing here, which is every decision you make is either going to be like a fear decision yep. or a growth decision. Yep. So if you're saying if your reasons for hiring are, but they're going to go somewhere else, that's a fear decision. Correct. If, if your reason for hiring someone is, boy, they're really going to improve the yes. entire organization. That's a growth decision. Absolutely. And, they sh and it has to be mutual. Because the I they want buy-in from that person. I don't want them thinking, they need me. I want them thinking, I want them and they want me. I want this to be voluntary. I want them to want to be working on my plans, on my company. I want that. But if I don't get that, now I've got a problem. i got someone who's a, a cancer, as you say. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get that person to agree to something. I don't care what that thing is. It doesn't matter. So would you agree to do this thing? No. Would you agree to do that thing? No. What will you agree to? Are you saying you'll agree to nothing? No, I'll agree to this. And if they say I'll agree to nothing, that's documented. But if they don't, they say oh, I'll agree to this. Awesome. You agree to that? I love it. Excellent. That gets documented. Now as they move forward, they won't do it. They were just doing it because they want you to shut up. They, they never do what they say. I should expect failure. They're not going to do it because they're the cancer. Right. So whatever they say, they're not going to do. Got it. You, you come back and say, but you told me you were going to do it. You're harassing me. I'm not harassing you. I'm asking you a question. You told me you're going to do it. Well, I'm, I am. When? Next Thursday? Next year? Awesome. Document it. And you begin to document insubordination and lying because that's your defense against the lawsuit is their, their lying and their insubordination. Now, they'll still sue you. But now when they see insubordination and lying, they'll begin to negotiate. And you negotiate them out. So you but, don't get sued. By you way, negotiate them out because they realize they have a bad case. When they see they have a bad case, you negotiate them out. And the problem is, if, if I'm the employer, I don't want to write them a check. I don't want to pay them off. You got to pay them off. Just negotiate them out. That's how you get rid of them without a lawsuit. By the way, the same advice applies to parenting. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and they will sue you too. Yeah, well, no, my, I, I treat my kids the same way. My, I, I don't order my kids. It's funny, my, my people always tease me. I have two daughters, and my oldest daughter's a teenager. They say, Larry, your daughter isn't very rebellious. I go, oh, yes, she is. She doesn't rebel against you. I don't give her anything to rebel, rebel against. <laughs> I don't give her any orders. So how can she rebel against me? I don't order her to do anything. Yes, she's my daughter. I order her to do nothing. She, uh, she had her first boyfriend last year. And one of my friends said, you let her have one? I said, could I stop her? Okay, did, did the boyfriend want to sleep over? No. But if no. he did? I might stop that. It's my house. I might, but I might not. Uh -huh. Because I'd rather have my daughter doing what she's doing in front of me than not. Hmm. Right? It's one of the reasons why people tease me. I play video games with my kids. Online video games with my kids. They go, Larry, it's kids games. Yeah, but I know what they're doing. So now I'm, I'm friends with their friends. They know their, that dad is, is playing with them. But I don't order them. I don't say don't play. I can't stop them. I can't, I, I think parenting, and this is going to sound crazy, is relatively easy if you understand two simple truths. Two. One, you aren't, your kids are not now and never will be you. Boy, is that hard to hear. But true. They're not now and never will be you. They are their own people. Number two, you cannot protect or control your kids. Period. Can't be done. Impossible. Don't bother trying. This goes to what you were talking about. Accept what you, can, what you can't change, right? I can't change that. If you accept that, it's only one thing, rule of parenting. Be a good example. Because kids don't do what we say. Kids do what we do. Sometimes. Yes. But just be a good example. It's your best bet. Now, it, does that mean my kid will be perfect? First of all, of course, not no kid's perfect. 
Does it mean my kid won't, won't make mistakes? Of course she will, tons of them. But I tell her the same thing. When you make a mistake, make sure I'm the first person you call. Hmm. First person. You are never trapped. Always call me because I'm the only person on the planet who will help you bury the body. <laughs> Nobody else will but me. So you always call me first. Then we deal with the rest. So anyway, I, I went way off topic. But, no, that's <laughs> but, good. But, but, but that's my point advice. on dealing with, dealing with a bad employee is not getting angry, not making a, a, what it, the PIP, which is a professional improvement program. It's a waste of time and energy. Would never do that. It's a total, total waste of time and energy. Don't write them up. Total time of, waste of time and energy. Don't do that. Give them a, have them commit to something. When they don't do it, they won't. Start documenting insubordination and say things like, is this an integrity issue? Is that the problem here? Do we have a problem with that? That'll get them them concerned about, wait a minute, is he calling me a liar? I'm not calling you a liar. I'm asking you a question. I'm not ordering anything. Document everything. All the documentation should never be things like, pursuant to our conversation. Nope, should be, hey, James, so glad we had that chat. So glad we talked because you agreed you were going to do that thing that we agreed to. Thank you so much. You're an amazing guy. See you tomorrow. Most people, when, when I say that, think, you're crazy. That's not professional. I know. Because remember, when they sue you and the lawyers come in, they will subpoena all of your stuff and they'll look at all your stuff. And if it's professional, they will take it as negative. But if it's friendly and nice, it's not negative, is it? He has no case. I want the lawyer to see, God damn, it's a bad case. In which case you negotiate well. Now, have you actually, have you been sued if, uh, by employees? I've never been, I've, I've never, never been had in to court. Be sued. I've never had, I've, 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 sadly I've been in court more than once. Uh, but no, but I've never been sued. And one of the reasons why is usually I'm a consultant. So I come in as I act as a senior executive, as a consultant, I carry my own insurance. And when people see that I'm not afraid and then uh, you only can sue me, they tend to not sue. Hmm. They tend to not sue. I'm not deep pockets, Right. They, they tend to sue deep pockets. I'm not deep pockets. So, so far, they haven't. Maybe one day. <laughs> we'll see. I can, one can only hope. When you become governor and I'm uh, sure you're I'll totally get corrupt times. and get bribed. Look, you got to give me 20 years before we get corrupt. Come on. I'm not, I'm not even close to corrupt yet. 20 years from now, they'll throw me out. Can so, only, we're knocking yes. on wood. <laughs> yes, that's good. All right. Um, let me move on. What's the funniest thing that has happened to you in reference to your business? Uh, one time... I was raising money for a hedge fund. Yeah. I, was, I had a hedge fund going and I had a good track record. And my neighbor said, oh, my boss, I, you know, I work for a big hedge fund. My boss runs a huge amount of money, tens of billions. Why don't you come in and meet him? Come with me to work. So I go in and his boss, nice guy, looks like my grandfather. He gives me a tour of the office. And we finally sit down in his office and say, he says, James, what can I do for you? And I describe my hedge fund. And I said, oh, I'd like you to put money in my hedge fund and he said you know i'll hire you any day you want you're a good guy i'll hire you any day you want but when i give you money i don't know what you're gonna do with it i don't know if it's where you're investing i don't know if you're investing in something you know corrupt or illegal or whatever and you know the last thing and he points to himself the last thing we need to see here is is the name Bernard Madoff Securities on the front page of the Wall Street <laughs> Journal. And and then I left his office and I was so depressed. Like, oh, this guy was like my grandfather. He wouldn't put any money with me. He wouldn't mm -hmm. give me a try. And then, of course, he the scandal broke out. He, he went to jail. And just like about a year ago, I, I called up his jail and asked him if he would, I asked the warden to ask him if he could come on my podcast. A few days later, warden gets back to me and says, Bernie doesn't want to go on your podcast. And once again, he said no to me. Bernie Madoff <laughs> said no to me. I'm thinking, what else? Is he just making license plates? Like, what oh else is he God. doing with his time? He can't talk to me. But I was all agitated until I re realized he's got my number. He just said no to me again. Yep. Driving me crazy. I like that. That's very good. That's good. I um, think what's the funniest thing happened to me? Ah, how I became a coach. I didn't want to be a coach. I wanted to be a trainer. When I started my business in 2004, I thought, I'm going to be the greatest sales trainer in the world. I'm going to make a bazillion dollars. I'm going to be better than all the rest. And that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to go in and train people how to sell, and I'm going to make a bazillion dollars. So I'm out there doing it, and I've started to, to do, uh, do well. And two are they're kind of related. So uh, this, it's going to be two stories. I hope I'm not driving you crazy, the person who uh, put, this, put this up. But the first one is how I got my first banking client. 
I had no experience in banking and I cut my teeth on only small businesses because who else would use me, right? I'm a, I'm a nobody with no name, 2004, trying to become this, this, this sales trainee guy and no one knew who I was. So most of my clients were like small business owners, right? Uh, one or two person shop, law firm, you know, yoga studio, stuff like that. So what I could, that's how I began my business. So now one of my friends gives me a referral into a bank. And the bank um, that I don't want to say, maybe I should say the bank. Anyway, the bank was one of those letter banks. That's what I'll say. One of the letters, right? Like RBS, UBS, HSBC. It was one of those banks, right? So I go there to, to pitch. And my pitching skill that my, my, what I, I taught was you never walk in with price, right? You have a conversation first, whatever. I specifically walked in with a proposal on paper. And on the top of the paper, I had one of those letters. It was the wrong letter bank. On purpose, I because ha- I always use, I put my clients um, or my prospects logo on my paper when I give them things, right? I don't put my logo. They know who I am. I let them know that I care about them. It's about them. So I put it there, right? So I sit there and I, it would say whatever. For the sake of argument, I'm going to say it was RBS for the sake of argument. Royal Bank of Scotland, for those who don't know, RBS. So I put UBS there and I, and I walk in. How you doing? Good to see you. By the way, here's my proposal. He goes, this is UBS or this is RBS. And I went, ah. Oh, Sorry, so many banks. So I said, sorry, so many banks. He hired me because the assumption was I had so many banking clients. I didn't say I had many banking clients. I didn't say anything. I simply said there are so many banks. And there are clearly so many banks. That's a true statement. So Not not as many as there were then, but yes. That's true. But my point was that I thought was funny. I was like, I didn't know if I'd get it. What I realized is if I had gone to a bank and said, please use me, Joe Schmo, with no experience, I'm not getting that deal. There's no way I'm getting that deal. So what I do instead, I literally said that. Tried it. I roll the dice. I'm losing. If I'm losing, I roll the dice. He might have said, you're an idiot. Get out. In which case, I was still going to lose the deal. So I had a loss worse. So I rolled the dice and it worked. Second banking piece. I'm going to a different bank. This time I'm going to, a, a, I'm going to an investment bank. This one was commercial, was, was retail banking, right? Training tellers and things of that sort, right? Retail banking, that. This is now going to investment banking. Now, the problem is the bank I talked about had both retail outlets and investments. The guys didn't know which was which. They just assumed it was investment. So this is back in about 2006, 2007. And imagine I'm going to one of those bankers. They're all wearing Rolex watches and they're all wearing, you know, $3,000 suits and the whole deal, right? I don't have any of that. I'm broke. I don't have any of that. Much. So what do I do? I said, I can't compete. With a, what, back then it was today's man. I can't, I can't give it to today's man or Sears suit. I can't do that. So what do I do? I'm, I'm a start, I'm a start, I'm a sci-fi geek. So I also have to like Doctor Who, right? I know I'm a geek. I'm sorry, guys, I am. So what did I do? I had a leather hat, a long scarf and a long coat, boots and slacks and a shirt, no tie. So I came in like that and they were like, it was no way for them to put me on their scale of, who I was. Right, so I were, was just You were different rather than trying to be better. I was just off the scale. And they assumed he does investment banking and he's weird. He must be some kind of like genius savant guy or something. That's what they thought. And they hired me. So I, that's how I got into investment banking. Now we go to the coaching piece. To the coaching piece. I was going to be a coach. I was just going to be a trainer. That's all I was going to do. But one of the things I teach all the time and I always do is I never want to tell my clients no. So if someone wants me to do something... I price them out, right? So if someone says, Larry, I want you to come to my house and cook me eggs, 100% I will, absolutely, $45,000, I'll be at your house cooking eggs, I'll bring my own eggs, my own pan, I got you covered. No one's gonna pay $45,000 for me to cook eggs, I don't have to cook eggs, but I didn't say no. They say no, I don't say no, I say yeah, 100%, I'll do whatever, yeah, 45 grand, I'm cooking eggs for you tomorrow morning, no worries, I'm there with my own eggs, farm fresh. (laughs) So yes, I will do that, right? So I, I still believe that back then I do it now. So then some guy, as he sees what I'm teaching, he goes, Larry, you're not really a sales guy. You're kind of like an influence guy. I said, yeah, it's true. He says, well, so here's what. I want you to help me personally. Like, can you coach me to be better? I said, of course I can. Now, I want you to remember where my mindset was. This was the first time I'd been in investment banking. Everyone else I dealt with was either a couple retail banks, but mostly was small business owners, right? One and two person shops. So I go, absolutely, 100%. I want uh, $5,000 up front, uh, no guarantees on when we meet, no guarantees on what we'll do, but we'll see what happens. He went, is that uh, Neo Sage? Let me check right there. 
Now I didn't realize this guy makes $2 million a year. Right. This was just like chump change. If like I a, helped him close one settings. deal, he puts a quarter million dollar in his pocket. Yeah. I didn't know that. I was ignorant, right? All I knew is no small business owner who runs a small yoga studio is going to give me five grand with no nothing. There's no way he would do that. And that's where my mindset was. So I took the money, of course, and I was like, guess I'm a coach. That's how I became a coach. How come your funny stories involved three successful sales <laughs> and my funny story, I was rejected twice by, by the biggest criminal of all time? Uh, I, I don't know. but I, I feel I, like yes. you're living a, a more interesting life. Maybe. I don't know. But those are, my, those are my, my funny stories, I think, and they're all early in my career. Mm -hmm. Those are all prior to 2008. Huh. Those are all prior to 2008. So, yes, I think one of the funniest things that happened during the campaign, which, which um, was I got a picture from a guy. Picture a guy sitting in front of his house, upstate New York. He has four signs. Four signs. Four, pi four, four banners slash signs. Banner one, Confederate flag. Banner two, the Gadsden flag with the snake, don't tread on me. Banner three, Trump 2016. <laughs> Banner four, Larry Sharp for governor. Uh, now you might say, how in the hell does that work, right? How does that, and this is, by the way, the Confederate flag upset New York. People are like, how the hell does that work? Does it make any sense? And I said, it makes total sense. Every one of those four are signs of rebellion. That's all they are. They're rebellion, right? To a, to a New Yorker, it's not a Confederate flag. It's a re rebel flag, right? It's a rebel. I'm rebelling, right? I'm rebelling. And then, of course, don't try to make rebellion. Trump was the ultimate rebellion in 2016. And I was a rebellion in 2018. So they were all signs of rebellion. And as my team looks at it, they're like, why did he send us this? What is going on? I'm like, they're the rebels. You should you should have made t-shirts with th all those flags. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like right when you write like the day before the election, when you, that you're gambling the dice, you're rolling the dice, just hand them out. It's funny. At, at the end, when we had extra shirts, we gave them all to homeless shelters. So hoping that, that, <laughs> hoping some people would go outside and wear them. We just gave them homeless Oh, shoppers. my God. So yes. now all these homeless people are wearing like Larry, Larry Shuffle Governor shirts. shirts. <laughs> how'd, yes. that, how'd that work out for you, homeless guy? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's too bad. Yes. So too bad it didn't work. But yes, that, that's, that's my funny story. So good. All right. Someone actually said they almost, uh, they almost uh, spit. Uh, they choked to death on their Diet Coke when I said it. Help bury the body. So anyway, yes. So let me ask you. Um, we're running out of time. Tell me, how do people get a hold of you? Uh, How do you want them to get a hold of you? What do you want them to see and hear and deal with? Yeah, I'm most proud of my podcast, The James Altucher Show. You can find it, you know, just Google The James Altucher Show on on iTunes or podcast, Apple Podcasts and, and Google, Google Play, Stitcher, whatever. And uh, very proud of it. I've had a fun, I've had a fun podcast. I'm, six, I'm six years in. There we go. We are rocking and rolling. I'm only, I'm less than a year and I'm six months in now. Not even, hold on. You're doing a good job. I'm about three or four months in, I guess, give or take in that area. So yes, yeah, so I'm a little bit. So all good though. I'm so happy you came. Um, I'm happy you're still libertarian. So thank you. You didn't give up on us. No. Um, uh, some people did. So I'm glad, I'm glad you did. And remember. I didn't give up on you, Larry. That's the key. That's the most important thing. And remember, don't go broke till 2023. Yes. No, <laughs> so I, then you can I'm go broke. I'm planning it then. Until then, hold out, plan, and we'll be fine. All right, guys. I want to say thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening. I will see you all next week here on The Sharp Way.